Hello and welcome to another episode of the Underhive Law Keepers podcast, the number one Necromunda Law podcast, because the Emperor loves us, even though we do not deserve it. As always, I am Spaniel, and to my right, the minorly mutated Manvent himself, Nathan. How are you, buddy? I'm, I'm very well. I'm, uh, I'm noticing that you're reusing one of our previously used M-word combinations. I have called you a mutant before, haven't I? In you fact, have. When was oh, that? It was, it was a recent episode, I think. Um, I think it was. Yeah. I'm not it was a really episode. funny... I think it was a really funny episode. Probably one where um, we broke the fourth wall of humour and cemented our position as quite possibly the funniest people in the world. I'm, I'm in total agreement with that. Definitely the funniest people I've ever met. <laughs> well, I have never had so many people from the internet question my parentage before in oh. my life. Wow. The number of times I've been called a bastard by people on the internet. <laughs> so we are a G-rated show. There was lots of... Lots of non-G-rated words that I saw. Oh, there was wow. T-words and C-words and B-words and Q-words. I didn't understand those ones, but that was okay. No, no. Yeah. It was, yeah. It, w- it was funny, and we are obviously operating at a level higher than your average individual. So I can understand that people... Um, would be upset and would maybe, I don't know, bully us into doing an episode that we weren't <laughs> expecting we had to do. <laughs> I, I do I do appreciate that. You would just attack everybody out there as well. It's like, oh, no, no, yeah. no. We're far superior to you. But we yeah. are be- getting bullied by you. So that's yeah. a little bit of a uh, odd position to be in. No, I um, I love the fact that our audience feel so comfortable with us as hosts and friends that they can just openly bully us on the internet and just be like, no, 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 you dummy dum-dums. We are the podcast hosts now. You will do this episode. Um, <laughs> we are your <and> producers. <laughs> we are the producers now. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, my God. We've finally made it big. We have producers. Yeah, I know. How good hey, is that? congrats, buddy. Yeah, I know. We're just, we're almost there. We're number one radio show, podcast show in the Imperium. It doesn't work when I do it, does it? No. No. You don't, you lack the passion. It's it's your inferior Escher man genes. But, (laughs) okay. Let's get, we have derailed before we've even gotten our jorts. (laughs) (laughs) I love jorts. Um, sure, it's a great. We yeah. we need to re-rail. So, re-rail. Uh, yeah, we made an April Fool's joke, and apparently people won't talk about ab humans. So we will get to ab humans. But what have you been up to, hobby wise, life wise? Have you read any books lately? What's going on in the world of you? <laughs> Lots of in-depth questions today. That's very nice. Um, other than being one part of the funniest two people that. Have ever lived, obviously. Uh, but apart from that, yes. Apart from that, I have hobby wise. I have played some more Imperialis actually, and had mm. a game of Necromunda with a friend of mine who wants to start playing Necromunda, and that was a uh, that was a good learning curve for me actually because there's just you know when you play a game and especially for us because we are law keepers, not rule keepers, you find out rules where you're like, oh that works. Oh, that's really mm. good. Oh, that's mm. amazing. And then you go Google it and you're like, oh, everybody knows about this. Okay. That's oh, that's a fun. core rule. That's, ah, uh, yes. 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 <laughs> yes. That's, this is an obvious thing. But uh, yeah, I had myself uh, over the Easter long weekend a bit of a specialist game uh, fanfare, really. And we played a bit more Imperialis with somebody else who wanted to learn how to play the game and they are thoroughly hooked and somebody else who wanted to play Necromunda and they are thoroughly hooked. So I'm expecting the check in the mail, Mr. GW. Well, I mean, 
naturally if if we're like sending them customers i can only assume they're going to be sending us money um, it, it seems right yeah. i'm i'm the probably number one best salesman currently in the last 72 hours i'd say i will Just- also accept models though like money slash miniatures because most of my money goes to miniatures anyway yes just cut out the middleman yeah. Well, my work was talking about doing salary sacrifice and I was like, oh, and for people who don't know, salary sacrificing is where they use your money before they tax it. So it's like pay for this and pay for that. And they were like, we can put money on a card for you. And all I could think of was nobody will ever know that I have this money and it'll just sit on a card for me. Tax-free miniatures is all I saw. I know it reduces my own wage, but I'm like, hey, it's tax-free miniatures. That's exactly where my brain went, which was sort of a bit of a, a wake-up call for me. I was like, oh, probably need to worry about food and rent and all the other things. But no, 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 no. Okay. You can, you can, you can eat sprue. Um, yep. It is nutritiously negligible, but there is nutrition. Um, yep. And you paint it different colours, and it tastes differently. It, we learned that in the Goliath episode. Exactly. Yeah, you you yeah. get a bit of red sprue, and you're like, "Ooh, spicy!" You know. <laughs> <laughs> the, anyway, the spicy sprue. The spicy sprue, not the gray, not that boring grey stuff. Yeah. Uh, oh. Base what? coat your sprues, people. Yeah. <laughs> Base coat them. Put a bit of black on there. It's a bit charred, but we can, you know, mm. add that for a little bit of flavour if you like that char grill flavour. Al um, dente. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Al dente. <laughs> It's just some Italian bloke I know. First name yeah. Al, surname ah, Dente. Al Dente, yeah. yeah Good Al Dente. Great. <laughs> anyway, I'll ask you the same questions. What have you been up to, hobby-wise, life-wise, and have you read a book or books um, or a comic? Or have you read a, a back of a cereal packet or just even the milk carton? Uh, I can answer no to all of those questions. Oh. No, work has been very, very busy. And apart from that, I... Played with some Space Marine Scouts for a while. Oh, yes. Just yes, looking yeah. just looking at them. And then I found a bunch of Scout bikers. And now I'm genuinely sitting here being like, should I make Imperial Fist Goliath? But I haven't really decided. Oh, sorry. Boo. Uh, oh, boo, boo. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure whether I will. I don't know. Um Imperial if anyone wants to subtly bully me into making Imperial Fist scouts into a Goliath gang, I will be accepting threatening messages via Instagram, Facebook, email. Uh, you can text me. It's cool. I just need the slightest provocation here, people. I'm sure all it will take is somebody going, hey, Sam, are you doing this? You'll be like, oh, okay, then fine. I'll do it. Yeah. I'll do I'm it. Gen- if you- <laughs> I'm genuinely expecting Underhive Dad to just be like, Hey, dummy, you should do some Goliath made out of uh, Space Marine Scouts. Be like, thank you, buddy. That's all I needed. <laughs> uh, um, no, apart from that, uh, I've done next to no hobby, which is upsetting, but I have a couple of days off coming up soon, I hope. And if I can just ignore my family for like three to five of those days, it would be great because I can get some hobby done. Well, that's um, you giving yeah, them enough the- time. That's the aim. That's the yeah. aim. Um, well, let's bounce into our episode, I guess, then. Yes. What well, are we talking about? Don't you get too excited there, buddy. Oh. Before okay. we get into the episode. Mate, I'll be a raging we've, beast. We've got a man. couple of... Uh, <laughs> we've got a couple of spam your corrections coming your way. And we actually have three corrections... So, oh, actually, two corrections and a point of note. Now, the first one, as always, is on your boy Spamuel here. And the first correction actually came from our buddy Craig, also known as Bad Wolf Miniatures on Instagram. Uh, do you remember when we were talking about, on the Chained Weapons episode, Chain Sights? Yes, I remember the chain scythe. And I think we... Didn't we mention that it's more like a theoretical weapon? That's I remember saying that. It is not a theoretical weapon. Uh, <laughs> I am a dummy. Uh, I believe the term dummy dum-dum 
has oh, been wow. thrown around. Official it's, titles. It's actually on the uh, Spyro Matriarch from N95. There is a freaking oh. chain scythe. Uh, do you know what? I've just literally looked it up then. Of course. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah. That was way back in the day. Wow. That's... Yeah. Good, One of just the call. absolute most terrifying miniatures. It's a crazy woman from the Spira, from the Spira, from the Spire, with my automatically now favourite chain weapon, a chain scythe. So, yes, Craig pointed that out to me. I and... tell you, it's an awesome looking weapon too, and like it sort of yeah. it, it sort of looks exactly the how I would imagine it to look. But it's weird because the cutting blade is on the outside. It's on. It's it's on the inside of it, which the blade of the oh my scythe God. Yeah, would sorry, naturally but... be sharpened there. But you yeah. have to, like, if you look at it, you're hooking that behind your enemy and ripping mm. it back towards you. You're disemboweling them from the back while they're facing you. Yeah, right. That is heavy metal. And also yeah. kind of a weird way to pick up guys. But... <laughs> She's but, not the most successful. Uh, she's she hasn't dated since M thirty nine. It's 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 okay. So yeah, I am ashamed and embarrassed uh, that I forgot about that one. So thank you very much to Craig for pointing that out to me. And the next one is actually on you, Nath Dog. Is it now? This one here was sent through to us by one of my glorious friends on Instagram, Sam, otherwise known as The Bulgar. Now, he pointed out the fact that you had said in regards to Gorefather that uh, Angron, once he realised it had been repaired, would have actually gone and recovered that weapon from the... I, I, I think we said it was the uh what's what I'm looking for? The like the world eaters or the corn berserker types that had recovered Gorefather, uh, repaired it and basically had gone on and used it as a I think he said it was a religious icon. Yeah, now, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sam actually pointed out to me here that and this is something I'd completely forgotten about. Um Angron, once his weapons were broken, uh he basically threw the damn things away and went because when because back in the day on you know it was in this area where he was a gladiator when weapons were broken they were discarded never to be used again so uh, manvent dummy he yes. would not have gone back to recover that weapon because he's not going to use it he's discarded it right okay fair enough i I can see that point of view, but I, I sort of, I think I'm implying the fact that he would go take it from them for them having repaired it, for them having recovered the weapon and would be like, no, 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 no. This belongs in the trash. You don't get to use this. You don't get to worship it. You get a bop on the nose or a fist through the face, same thing. And I take the weapon back and I put it in the bin, the, the corn's special filing cabinet where you hit, nobody else can touch it. <laughs> so oh, I th- okay, I, so I you're that's implying what... that he's saying, I threw this away, no mm. one is allowed to use this. Yes, so when he goes to recover it, he's like, no, this is, you know, it, it, if that be the case where he doesn't want anybody to use it, he would be going, no, 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 nobody is to use this weapon at all. It is, it is broken, it is cursed pooey you know and then yeah no not even not any veneration of it whatsoever i don't like the fact that you've been able to justify that straight with, away with the truth um, with, with justice <laughs> with the ability to <sighs> tell people out there who are trying to attack me on multiple levels that no i know where i stand or sit because we're currently recording Hello? Listeners, this is once again a call out to my loyal brothers and sisters of the Underhive. 
please find me a man vent correction that I can use to finally shut him up and maybe <laughs> just for one episode come out on top as opposed to being the one with all of the damned corrections. Mate, you just got um, Moyed. Deal with it. <laughs> Moyed. <laughs> all right, done. Um, Anything else you got in your little briefcase uh, well, of bullshit? Yeah. <laughs> My briefcase of bullshit? Yeah, I'm pretty annoyed about this. <laughs> okay. No, I actually have a pretty cool tidbit of info. Um, oh, yeah. From a listener of ours by the name of Tom, who emailed us with a, actually a pretty rad throwback. Uh, do you remember the dog soldiers from the um, Goliath episode? Yes, they were the ones that had the theme song, weren't they? What? They had the theme, the theme song. You remember? No. No? Do you remember it was a, who let the dogs out? Huh? That one? No, no, <laughs> no. I'm deleting you from the podcast. I'm not just editing out that joke. I'm editing you out. Ah, you said a joke. Yes, oh, I'll take that. Thank you very much. That was really well done. Okay. <laughs> um, the dog soldiers were the unborn gang. And Yes, yes. I, do, I, do, I actually do remember yeah, them. I'm yeah. just being naturally well, funny. Tom sent me a link to an absolutely awesome interview with Andy Chambers himself. Oh, yeah. And it turns out that the dog soldiers were Andy Chambers' Goliath gang all the way back then in N95. That's awesome. Yeah, this interview uh, from, like, 2020... Uh, yeah. is talking about, you know, the the creation of Necromunda, the, like its sort of um, its roots and confrontation. And Andy Chambers talks about helping Jervis Johnson run uh, games, like participation games of confrontation and that sort of thing. And it's got these amazing pictures of his Goliath. And these these are just sick old school models. And... It's like, it's, it's awesome. And when Tom emailed me, I was like, hey, man, you might not have ever read this and sort of send that through to me. I read that I was just like, firstly, Tom, like, this is awesome. Are you cool for me to read this out on the, um, on the next episode? And he was all for it. He's just like, you know, just happy to, sorry, just happy to get the info out to you guys. And so, Tom, thank you so much for this. I'm shooting the pictures through to Nathan now so he can check those out. And, like, they are just... It's just wow. awesome. I love seeing these sort of old school, um, sort of the roots of what we what we play now. And just to know that this cool yeah. bit of lore that we just talked about goes all the way back here to, to N95. Like, yeah. it's, it's awesome. I love them. This, uh, oh, mate, this is flashbacks for me looking at this gang. This is so cool. Even the terrain that they're on. The old school terrain, oh, yes. Oh, my God. This is like teenage Nath just going, yeah, this is the sickest thing ever. He's got a rat skin in the gang. Oh, how cool. And they just, they don't look perfect. Do you know what I mean? No, They no. look like the trash of the underhive getting together and saying we're the enforcers of this territory now wow yeah, oh my cool. god this is they actually look so cool if you if, yeah if you get a chance just google um andy chambers dog soldiers if you can't find the um the actual interview yeah and i'll i'll uh, link the interview in the oh, show yes yeah, yeah do that yeah, yeah nice and easy people need to see those miniatures just to you know, I, I guess for a lot of people who only know the modern day Goliath, um, it's going to look a little bit odd and a little bit sort of off kilter. But yeah. there's there's a, a real character, a real sort of majesty to these miniatures that makes you just go, yeah, I could see them being real scrappers, real, you know, down and outers. They look they look so cool. Yeah, oh, 100%. I love them. I think they're so good. <laughs> but... Oh, yeah, freaking brilliant. Well. 
Well, right before we get into the episode, we want to give a shout out to our new Patreons, or as I call them, Patties, because I think the word Patreons sounds weird. Yes, it, it, I, I do agree. Patties does sound good, whether they be like flat little patties or patties as in like Irish people. I don't know. I don't know what you're going for, but I do I don't know it. if any of them are Irish, but I think... Well, no, they're all you know, patties now. You're all yeah. Irish now. <laughs> Deal with it. I'll organise for each of you to get a passport. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hold you to that promise. Oh. Every single patty is getting, a, is getting an Irish passport. Thank you, Sam. Done. Locked in. Damn it. <laughs> did, did, I just, did I just become a human trafficker? Um, I think so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, call oh, me gonna... Spam Diddy. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> oh, my God. Um, yeah, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll punch through our list of uh, beautiful, wonderful patties that we have. Uh, here's the first one here. Oh. A nice, proper Imperial Gothic name, William. Well done. Excellent work, William. Thank you for your contributions and support. Panny, David, Luke, Jim Barb. Fantastic name. That's uh, the winner so far. And Chris. Thank you all very much for your support and your dedication to our show. But a uh, special mention goes out to Trent. He is our first Karyatid Club member, and as such, we'll be getting an episode of his choosing. So he will come up with the episode and not just bully us into it, like actually, yeah. hey, this is what I'd like to see, not just be like, you said abhumans, now do abhumans. And we're like, oh, sorry, I guess we'll do abhumans. Um, Can't make a joke about abhumans anymore. No, right. it just really upsets people. Yeah. So they use many different words and not all of them naughty. Um, I got sworn at so much. It was actually quite upsetting. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know what? I've never been bullied online. But then when this happened, I was like, oh, I get it. I get Mm, it. I get it. It's a bombardment. I get it. Yeah. 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 And it was, I guess it was all done with a sense of like, ah, you guys are scoundrels. But like, there was. But if uh, you don't give us the Ad Humans episodes, we will come to your houses. Yeah, exactly. There was was some. Not very well veiled threats, some thinly veiled threats in there. But getting back to Trent, um, yeah, he'll be getting to pick a topic that we will do an episode on and uh, derail on multiple, multiple times. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to derailing it for him and somehow turning whatever he picks into really just 11 gang ideas um, <laughs> that just we constantly just scream at each other about. <laughs> Uh, and then someone makes it. Someone on the internet makes it, and we're just like, we could never make anything that good. Yes. So, yeah. Shout uh, out to so, Soup. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to our boy Soup. Soup. Uh, so yes, to all of our new Patreons, thank you so much for sort of jumping on board with us. Especially you there, Trent. Like I said, we like Nate said, you are our first Carry to Club member, and you will be getting an episode of your choosing done as soon as possible. And if you are interested in becoming a Caritude Club member or any of our other Patreon levels, please shoot over to patreon.com forward slash the Underhive Lawkeepers podcast. As we've said many times, we are 100% funded by the goodwill of our audience and we do love doing this either way. Each month we have Patreon exclusive episode as well as moving into some competitions, polls on episodes and other bonus content. If you are looking at another way of supporting us, get onto our social media, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. A like and subscribe helps us grow and get our particular brand of Necromunda lore out into the world. All of the links will be in our show notes. And if you have just a moment extra, don't forget to give us a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. I will Cut. say, I will say that we got actually an increase of people on our Patreon after our fantastic after April the, Fool's episode. After the April Fool's joke. <laughs> we got like, I'm pretty sure one of those people joined just so he like they could be like, you're a tool, Spam. Yeah. yeah. And just quickly, why is everyone blaming just me? You are just as responsible for no, this. No, no, no. Hang on a second here. I'm the, the lovable rogue. I'm the, you know, the one that comes up with the best ideas. You're just sort of more like the 
the face of the show, which is it's not a great face for the show, but you know that's why you deserve it's, it. You you chose that role. It's the one we've got. Um, <laughs> yeah, I do agree. I, I I have dodged quite a few bullets. Here well, one from of the, the and let me quickly bring this email up. Um, yeah. Um, hi guys, love the show. Have been listening for a couple of months now and I'm up to date and love everything you guys do and say. I love the gang ideas. I love the derails and rerails. I disagree with how Nathan says Delark. Thank you, my dude. Uh, <laughs> but I am still on board with everything you guys have done. Dot, dot, dot. Until <laughs> the Ab Humans episode. Boys, <laughs> I'm not angry. I'm disappointed. It's my dad sending his emails. <laughs> Stop it. You're not allowed to. No. Um, then it, was, it says here, um, I'm looking forward to the two of you making this right. Keep up the great work, Daniel. Uh, Daniel, you have broken me, sir. You have broken me. And because of this, because of the bullying and emotional trauma that you people have given us. This is episode one on a series about abhumans. I hope you're happy. We give in. Are you happy, people? <laughs> we give in to your bullying, your harassment, and just your just general unniceness towards us regarding the two funniest people you'll ever listen to. So, yeah, I... I I am on board with you, Sam, that we are broken, but we will persevere and we will push on because that is the nature of who we are. And speaking of pushing on, this has been, I think, the longest opening to an episode we've yes. ever done. So let's talk about Abby. You all thought we did it again, didn't you? You heard that little <laughs> pause and it's just, oh, they've done it to us again. Oh, we're not getting an Ab Humans episode. <laughs> oh, we have to send a, more emails telling Spaniel we're disappointed in him and causing him to cry. No, no, we are actually talking about Beastman this episode. Well, Ab Humans and then Beastman. Yes. <laughs> it was almost double <laughs> April Fool's there. Double April Fool's. Uh, uh, we wouldn't do that. We're genuine professionals. Yes. Wouldn't allow that to happen to the uh, podcast. May, on the but... other hand. <laughs> so, abhumans. Now, abhumans. Abhumans themselves are what is commonly known as a descendant of baseline human settlers whose ancestors mutated and or physically adapted to various extreme environmental conditions after being isolated for thousands of standard years on colony worlds across the galaxy. Some abhumans may also be intentionally genetically engineered mutants created for a specific purpose. Now, one of the reasons I think abhumans are so cool is because it is... The, the the massive situation of evolution where in some cases it is absolutely natural and it's the the human body simply adapting and overcoming the adversities that these new planets or planetoids or stations or whatever are providing and they're causing these mutations where it's that second point that really gets me. It's like, oh man, the oxygen on this planet sucks. Yeah, it, it does. You know what we should do? We should engineer our lungs to start breathing like more nitrogen or... Um, or less oxygen. Yeah, wait. You know. Wonka's our scientist. Wonka, what do people breathe? Get back to me before we start recording this episode. Um, <laughs> but, like, you yeah. know, yeah, they're, they're, they're actively forcing it all. You know, we've got a lot of water, so um, why don't we engineer, like... Webbed the feet ability and hands. to be more aquatic, exactly, yeah. yeah. So they can actually thrive better on the planet. What do you mean that gets to you? In what sense? I think it is awesome. I think this is the the red. 
ridiculousness of 40k um where it's just like evolution takes thousands and thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of years whereas between like you know the golden age of technology to sort of now that 40k era it's at max what like 20,000 years, give or take, uh, between uh, well, human the heresy colonization. Is 10,000 years, and yeah, so from the heresy to now is 10,000 years, and then yeah, so for yeah, say 20,000, yeah, 20, 20, but at a stretch, 30, you know, or if we want to keep it thematic, 40,000 years, which makes sense because that's we'll have a 40,000, so it's 40,000. Okay, years. let's look at let's look at 40,000 years from now. We have entire human subspecies completely diver- diverging from what we have now, that baseline human, and turning into completely, like, identifiably separate strains of humanity. Ah, uh, like, I, th- I think it's awesome. I agree with you there. Like, I, it, it's identifiably different, but not completely different. Do you know what I mean? We're not. Not looking something yeah. that goes well. It's got four arms. Yes, it's an excellent worker, and gives the best high fives. But it's it's clearly it's not purple human. and has head ridges. Yeah, 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 exactly. Well, no, but I mean, you know, you think about it. If you were to add more limbs to a human, you go, yeah, that's fine. It, it could probably work and function a lot better. But you you can't go down that that pathway with the I guess with the the modifications to the humans, but adding gills. I guess I guess what I'm trying to say is, as long as it's concealable, as long as they could, in some way, shape, or form, pass as a human with the right amount of covering, you're probably okay. And that's where uh, I I put that in as a you're, sort of a thing. To you're heading down that mutation route there, I think. Um, and uh, this is actually something I think is a very important point to bring up. The difference between a mutant and an abhuman. Now, I have a very simplistic view, and if you disagree with me, please tell me. My view on the difference between a mutant and an abhuman is if you have a pair of mutants and they breed and produce a child, you do not know what you are going to get. You are going to get, if you have your four-armed fella and... uh, woman with lizard skin are you going to get a four-armed fella with lizard skin or are you going to get a regular person that just have has tentacles and no bones uh you, you don't know yeah, whereas no. and that's why i see mutation as well but yeah go on what you what were you saying about the actual ab human if you take two ab humans and i think i know what you're going to say immediately after i say this you're going to be like well actually if you take two ab humans of the same kind and have them breed they will produce a, a child of their ab human strain now i think you're about to bring up navigators because the navigator gene despite making them an ab human isn't guaranteed to pass along through parents exactly exactly yeah it is, and that is almost a mutation yes do you know what i mean that's a, a we were i have opinions it? on navigators well we were mentioning it uh, in a in another episode or maybe it was in the april falls episode i'm not 100 percent sure now because that was very funny but um <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it where the mutation is like so a psychic mutation you know can can not carry across into a child. Yes, right? absolutely. So that, that child might be completely fine or might be a, a blank or might actually become a stronger psyker of some description. I think the psychic, when you, when you talk about psychers, it's the best way to understand exactly what mutation is about because it is something that is, it can vary in such great degrees and understanding, but the, the human themselves still stays the same. So... Whereas with other forms of mutation, as you're saying, tentacles and no bones, you've got, you've got, you've got something that is existing that is clearly and quite evident a mutation. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that when you look at mutation, you need to understand that is it is the full spectrum. And and when we when we when I talk about mutation in this context, 
get rid of any sort of chaotic influence. There's none there. Yes. Uh, in my mind, this is uh, a cause of environment. It is a cause of, you know, chemicals. It's a cause of genetic testing that some yep. unscrupulous members of the Imperium are doing. And I'm, I'm not even looking at like your Fabius Biles or anything. Let's just talk about what's happening on a planet. And the Goliath are an excellent idea, concept for that. Yes. Because they are created, they get tested on, and then they create these things that they just kill in the vats because they're just, no, we can't, we can't have that running loose, so we kill it off. If that had been given an opportunity to breed and grow and change and develop, what kind of mutation would it develop? Now, yes. the Goliaths are interesting because they are also, in a way, abhuman. Well, well, we mentioned that in the Goliath episode. Yeah. Multiple, yeah. it was Majos Biologists and the uh, Minostorum. Minostorum? No. Uh, Munitorum? Adept- Minotor- Min- Adeptus Minotorum. Someone. It wasn't someone. the Minostorum because they're the priests. Yeah. Um, no, it wasn't Minostorum. It's, Minot- it's the admin Administratum. Guys. It's Minostratum. That's it. Admin. They were sitting there being like, oh, nah, man, if we, get, if we get enough people to tick this bad boy off, it's an abhuman... It loses human rights because, you know, we have those in the Imperium. And yeah. we can we can just ship them off wherever. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. I. And we've, that's... We've gone on a bit of a tangent here already. I know. But, but it's, it's a... We need to... It's, it's a muddy area that you need to get some clear definition on. Mutation, random, could be anything, probably still going to be classified as a human or just can be... Inst- instantly regarded as a mutant kill it do you know what i mean yes so whereas abhuman there's a lot more frameworks around it within the the context of the imperium and within the context of necromunda about whether or not it can be killed on site or you know does it does it need to be brought in for more testing does it need to be understood exactly what pathway it took and necromunda is different because i think for me I'm going to throw this one out there. Correct me if you're not happy with it, but the the nomads are definitely abhumans, in my opinion. Wrong. So wrong. Right. Okay. Wrong. Yeah. Wrong. Just... <laughs> wrong. No. Um. I I agree with you. I I believe they are abhuman to a degree. What to what degree we don't know. Exactly. Yeah. But. I also believe, given uh, that we find out that that I mean, if you haven't listened to our uh, Aranthia Succession series so far, I'm going to save you like forty six hours of listening. Uh, when that no, when the Lady of Ash says to Hera and calls her sister, that to me implies we talked about that Phoenix Lord situation. Uh, yeah. I believe the nomads will be made up of a multitude of peoples being baseline humans as well as abhumans, but at their core, much like the Dalark, uh, will be influenced by a separate force. Um, Ooh, be it that... That's... I want to have a chat about the nomads right now. We shouldn't oh, because we it's can't. an abhuman episode. We can't. But because... I, I, I still I think they're proper natives. Of Necromunda. I, a I, I think the true nomads will, in fact, be the descendants of the original human colonists yep. of Araneus Prime. Exactly. And they've been modified by their environment, hence we've become abhumans. Correct. Thank you very much. Yes. 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 One anyway, mo- moving on. Um, uh, yes. The reason, we, the reason we went into the difference between mutants and abhumans is because... Uh, especially given today's topic uh, of beastmen, a lot of people consider the beastmen to be mutants. But we we want to clear that up going into this and sort of bringing in some of the very old lore of beastmen in 40k, bringing in a lot of the newer stuff. Um, we may, and I'm, I'm, this is questionable, we're not usually one to go away from official publications we may bring up some of our own theories uh some of our own ideas you know Ooh. some uh, that's some divergent hobby. for us isn't it yeah it, it really <laughs> is now uh, yeah 
I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Beastmen, so I'm sort of like quaking at trying to <laughs> jump into this, but I don't want to sound too excited too quickly. <laughs> well, I just one more clarification about the the abhuman. So the, the we think they're derived from the terms apparent human or abnormal human, or there is actually Sam found this, which is a great little term. It's from derived from high gothic. I mean, yeah. from humans, which is what I abide by. It's not abnormal. It's not ab- abhorrent or abhorrent or whatever. It is actually from human. So the genus of it is human and it just has all these, I don't know, extra add-ons. It's been, you know, had to have the spoilers and the fenders put on and the, the flashy rims and now it, and now it, it can navigate through the warp. It's a, just a, it's a, just a different flavour. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I like uh, that high gothic term of ab humanus. I think you know it's that yep. it's that weird pseudo Latin sort of like yeah you know vini vidi vici you know I saw I came I conquered yada oh. yada yada and these and these imperial types just mm, mm, and there's just three Goliath going. Mm, mm. I thought yes, that was the, the name of the three Goliaths. Yeah. Vinny, Vici, and Vidici. And <laughs> <laughs> Wait, are all Goliath Italian? It would make sense. It and they're all from Brooklyn. They're all, they're all Brooklyn Italian, which is why. Uh, no, no, no. I like Brooklyn. I'm not throwing shade at Brooklyn. If we're oh, going to no, make fun I of like anyone, Brooklyn. it's Boston. Okay. Boston. All right. All scum. Terrible buns. Terrible buns, All, I get you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boston buns, the worst buns. <laughs> but uh, yeah. apart from alienating our audience, uh, so in an Imperium of Man where genetic mutation from the human baseline and spiritual corruption are often viewed as interrelated or one in the same, abhumans are a focus of much controversy for the Imperial government. Abhumans are distinct from true mutants in that they conform to a common physical phenotype, demonstrate reproductive stability, and are no more susceptible to further mutation than normal humans. This is everything we just talked about. Yeah, but the the key thing for me, demonstrate reproductive stability. That is the most important thing. And... It, it, the the modern imperium would see that, and I know we're we're still talking about the, the the deep history of it, but the modern imperium would see that as is this a tangible resource for us? Yes. Can can we legitimately produce millions, if not billions, of this abhuman class so that they can work in their field of specialization? That's the key thing, and this is something I know we don't talk about enough. At its very core, the Imperium is a business. It is a corporation. The Emperor is simply the greatest CEO ever <laughs> because the Imperium itself That's right. he's runs... Jeff Bezos. Yeah. He's Jeff Bezos, yes. <laughs> uh, the Imperium itself runs on its industry. and Did you say industry? I said industry. Did you because industry? Right. the bad guy of 40K at the end of the day is capitalism. And if you've smashed it right smack bang in the middle there, if we have a situation where this particular abhuman strain is of benefit to us and the, you know, the, the cost value analysis shows that using these abhumans is going to be cheaper, more effective and cause less disruption than either having to terraform for humans or purchase safety gear, or, you know, get rid of a a heretical sect of the imperial truth, whatever. If it is easier to just use the abhumans that are already there, we're going to do that. Look at the Goliath and the Ogrens. Like, we talked about that, you know. But there's even... We we talk about... Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Mm. We talk about strength and tangible things that we can see on the tabletop, right? So strength is obviously a big one maybe better fighters or whatever, but you could have abhumans that maybe are quite pronounced at being able to sniff out water, you know? Yes. And so you go put them on planets that are just hellholes, but they can find the water sources because that is their 
their mutation or their, exactly. their difference. Yeah. And the so, colonists just keep a small, you know, a, a, a hmm. family group, you know, depending yeah. on how these particular ab humans um, create uh, society, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, you just happen to have this breeding stock of this particular type of water sniffing ab human. And it's just, it's a desert planet. And you go, all right, well, we need to go and set up a new mine wherever. We're not going to go and we're not going to waste the Admax time and have them do set out mining probes and scan the planet and no, mm. just grab one of the grab one of the snuffies as I'm calling them, <laughs> grab one of the snuffies, slap a leash on it, head out to where the mine's going to be, mate. They'll sniff out H two O within a you know a ten k radius. I don't know what that is in freedom units. I think it's like seven thousand fridge lengths. Yeah, um, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. about um, that. Yeah, but but so that's. I think I love that. I think that's great. <laughs> I'm gonna the I'm snuffies, just gonna... not the fridge lengths. Yeah, the snuffies. It honestly sounds a lot more disturbing than you think it is. But anyway, um, the the way I see them is they've got almost like a a divergence on the religion as well. Uh, God forbid I talk about religion in 40k again, but. Uh, religion and uh, industry. It's all we religion and industry. This is my two favorite things. And engineers. This is like, <laughs> engineers. Yeah. So if you, I could see them almost having these rituals that would be just bypassed by the priests. They just go, look, that's a ritual. Oh. That's that's what they need to do to be able to go off and find the water that keeps us going, keeps us ticking over. So the priest would allow them to go off and have their ritual and, it, you know, maybe they see the the emperor as, you know, that, that gives them their divine capability to go off and find this water. But you would almost have these little sects that would arise and, and the navigators would be treated the same as well. Navigators, are, you know, they're, they're messing around in stuff they're told not to mess around with, but there's a little bit of leeway given. Now imagine this in a more rural setting where it's not as militaristic, it's not as structured and you need to be able to give these ab humans just that little bit of extra just to, okay, we need you for this particular task and it's not your strength, it's not your, you know, it's not your combat ability, it's something that we need to actually survive and by surviving we give off to the tithe which means that we can maintain our industry. Oh, by the way, just a quick side note to the word industry there is a particular listener of the uh, podcast who is keeping track of how many times I mention the word industry. And I'm just going to mention it lots because he is on my back about it. Shout out to uh, Trent, our first Carrotted Club <laughs> yeah. Patreon. Um, I believe he was uh, enjoying a, uh, enjoying the, the finest of wild snake every time you say, what word was it? Industry. Oh, sorry. I think I've said it wrong. Industry. Industry. Excellent. Excellent. Industry. <laughs> Industry. I think that's um, about a bottle. <laughs> yeah. I actually have a bone to pick with you in regards to this. So I don't want to talk too much about navigators because yep. I think we're inevitably going to do an episode about the navigators as well because I think they're an incredibly complex yet. I can't. I really feel bad for them. Um, But... I love where you're going with this, where it's like, do you remember oh, was it Bolts of Temenos episode? We were talking about the ecclesiarchy where they'd be tra training the missionaries in yeah. going to the different places. You know, oh, what's this? You go to this planet? Cool. They worship the sun. Teach them the emperor is the sun. You're done. What's You go to this planet. They worship this volcano. Guess who the volcano is? That's right. It's Big E Vesuvius. Etc. Etc. <laughs> Whereas these particular priests around these snuffy tribes are basically told, "Listen, when it comes to them finding water, their shaman is going to do a bunch of nonsense, and you're going to want to strap that bloke to a spike and set him on fire. Do not do that. All yeah. right, because yeah. the the planetary governor and the the, the ecclesiarchy." hierarchy within the sector see that it is too important that this planet gets water so we have taught them that what the shaman is doing is praying to the emperor to pass along that knowledge and the, the missionary is like got it 
got it. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. And it yeah. turns out, you know, they're they're, you know, eating space mushrooms and, you know, then consuming like the brain of a interplanetary armadillo, whatever it is, where that thing is a hat and you find some water. <laughs> yeah, um yeah. But this missionary, that first couple of times is just going to be like, what is this heresy? This is, this, yeah, it's proper heresy. Yeah. I get the flamen with her. we got to, you know, we've got to torch every single we're, one of them. We've got to clear. And he turns the, around to the local, like, sort of PDF sergeant. And he's just looking, just shaking his head like, no, no. No, no. No, no. This is, this is what we do here. This is what and we this do. And this is, this, mentioning this is exactly what I wanted to try and get into, is how abhumans are accepted across the galaxy. You know what I mean? It, it's not necessarily about how well they fight in combat, but what they can bring to their particular sector, their particular planet, you know. So when you have something, and obviously we're going to go into it a lot more, but when you have something like the basement, they instinctively, straight away, you go, no, absolutely not. You know, that that priest is just going to be like, no, no, no. And they'll be like, well, actually, the beastmen that we here have here in this battalion, they're the only ones who can clear that hill of this particular creature. They, they know how to hunt it. Yep. They know how to fight it. And they'll live in those caves. They'll survive in those caves. We've had, you know, thousands of men go in there and handfuls come back. But the beastmen, they'll send 200 and they'll get 150 back and they will have cleared those caves for another 10 cycles. So we let them do what they need to. They've got blood rituals. Go about it. You know. Don't care. They they mm. uh, they are their shamans. Get them together. And those prisoners that they're killing, we've already interrogated them. We don't care. We've got all the information we need from them. So the shamans, when they're executing those captured yeah. prisoners that we don't have use for anymore, go and listen. Who are they praying to? And the missionaries standing there going, "Ooh, okay, okay, what's going on here? They're praying to the emperor." They're they're begging for yeah, forgiveness yeah. for the for the their very being, and this missionary is just like, oh, oh okay, oh okay, okay, yeah. and they're like, yeah, we've we've dealt with worse than this with feral world humans, and they exactly. love Big E. You're yeah. just angry because these blokes are hairy, don't have feet, and occasionally do like a hundred tiny little black pebble poos. You're a racist. Um, <laughs> and everything's in an eight-pointed star. Like, yeah, every bit of jewelry everything. they have. Yeah. Like, no, we just, you know, they the eight personalities of the emperor we worship. There you go. You can yes. have that. Yes. <laughs> but <laughs> the, I'll just do a little part of our read, but I, I do want to get back into talking about the acceptance of the beastmen. In more enlightened times, under the direct rule of the emperor of mankind, during the Great Crusade in the late 30th millennium, even markedly deter- divergent abhumans such as beastmen could serve in the imperial army, and that's where I'm driving a lot of that's this from. It. So they see the, they see the Great Crusade. They see the numbers required. They see the pressure being put on all the human systems, and then they're having to take on human systems that don't want to fight with them either. You know, they're saying, "Well, no, no, no. We're we're not part of your imperium, Big E. We're part of our imperium." We already have an emperor or they said we don't need you we 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 know about terror and we've moved far away from terror we've moved past the reliance on terror so even if you were to integrate those troops into your army you don't know what they're going to do and henceforth the horus heresy that's why you get so so many solar auxilia turn and what have you but we're not going to go down that pathway because that's like opening up pandora's box in terms of a ridiculous amount of corrections so but the idea that why would they be recruiting basement especially during a period of time as great crusade is to unite humanity these would be perfect for frontline shock troops imagine dropping them on humans that think you're the big evil and you drop 500 you know five five hundred thousand basement into their front line and you just go let them have it they they have been the most obnoxious people to try and negotiate with just go go absolutely ballistic on them, wipe them all out. And then what they do is they hit the big exterminators button after the beastmen are finished while the beastmen are still down on planet. Nobody knows the beastmen ever existed. All the Minotaurian priests say, well, they were our corrupted brothers and they needed to go. They served their purpose. Exactly. They were a meat shield. We pushed 
2,000 of them out the front of the regiment. They ran, and don't get me wrong, they were mowed down by, uh, you know, rifle fire, minefields, razor Mm. wire. They were hitting booby traps, and they were just being taken out. They only got to half of them. The other half got to their front line. And yes, they all died. But the victor, at the end of the day, were the human regiments. Yeah. Walking over those now cleared battlefields and just mopping up whatever resistance was left. Yeah. Why? Because the beastmen served the purpose that they had. And that's why even during the Great Crusade, you're looking at it and going, well, they are... They are still a part of humanity. They are a divergent part of humanity, but they are a part of humanity nonetheless. Exactly. And so they would be taken on their merits and what they're capable of doing for humanity. And they would not be within, included within the Imperial Army if they could not prove their worth on whatever system they first came into. And it, it may have been that they even found a planet entirely made up of beastmen but they worshipped the emperor they understood that the emperor the that big e was the most important figure in the galaxy in the universe and so they would be worshipping him and when that when that first great crusade ship arrives and they all talk about the emperor and the importance they just be like we're on board don't worry about it don't worry about how we look we're on board they're and all rocking around in the t-shirt with the the big e and me in the love heart yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> the key in me. And so what would happen from here is the Imperium would look at it and go, our solar auxiliary stocks are depleted. We need shock troops. We need assault troops. We're not going to keep sending our Marines in there. No point wasting our good stuff on testing the enemy defences. These are, these are perfect example of what we can use. Or it's a forest planet and you can just send down a beastman. Yep. And they can just cause havoc for decades on that planet. You know, just completely decimate the local defences and the local population and set themselves up, you know, that they almost become a colony on that planet. Then the Imperium rocks up, goes, fantastic, thank you very much, Beastmen. Herd them all into a ship, fly it into the sun, whatever the case might be. Or it's fly it into the next battlefield. Fly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Yeah. just you're you're just going to... Throw them into meat grinder after meat grinder after meat grinder. You don't care. They yeah. are disposable units. Yes, but now the question comes is where do you think they come about from? Okay. You know? Well, the Beastmen, also known as the Homo sapiens veriatus, are abhumans who are descended from baseline human stock who combine the physical appearances of humans and certain Terran animals, usually ungulates like goats or rams. And uh, although the traditionally model-wise, they've always been very, very similar. Like we've, we all know the, they're the goat men, they're satyrs. Um, yeah. Beastmen do not necessarily look alike, and different animal traits can manifest themselves in each individual. But apart from this form of phenotypical variation, they are a genetically stable human subspecies. And because of this, as we've discussed so far, are considered to be a form of abhuman rather than an actual mutant. So, man, I don't... I know know you've got something prepared here, but I, I have a couple of theories on this. Or far away. I want to hear theories before I go into the imperial truth. I think they were. I think they were most likely built as a uh, much like the Goliaths. I think they were a. They were probably a worker species. They were Righto. effectively cre- yeah. built as they were created as a worker or slave case. To, to be spread across either the Imperium, well, not the Imperium, but uh, human colonies at large, or mayhaps at some point during the Golden Age of Technology, they this particular planet or section sector or whatever just needed a number of workers and they've created them. But it, it makes sense, your theory of that they are workers. So, 
you know, the humans are looking at the beasts that they use as their working animals and they're going, well, we need something that we can actually communicate more with. It's a bit more sentient and we need something that is uh, stronger than us and more capable of, you know, surviving arduous environments. So let's create this and mash this together. So that, that, that makes a great deal of sense in the sense that they would find their animal that's working and what they require from themselves, jam the two together and pray to everything noble and glorious that they create something that's not going to turn on them and wipe them out. But yeah, their, their origins are unknown. And I'll, I'll just go into it a little bit here. Though it is likely that they are a result of experiments in genetic engineering stretching back to the dark age of technology before the birth of the Imperium of Man, they actually began to be able to breed properly and what, what we talked about earlier, have that um, stable breeding process where they're creating the same abhuman over and over. Other imperial scholars claim that the beastmen are abhumans whose unusual forms were the result of exposure to the unnatural influence of the warp, but that the subspecies somehow managed to maintain an unusual degree of genetic stability across generations. Unlike other such mutations, born of the power of chaos. No, so I hate that second one. I I don't agree with that at all. Like that that doesn't make sense to me. The way chaos works. Like I, yeah, yeah. I I don't believe that it's like oh we've got our we've got our juicy fingertips on you people. You're mutants now. It's just like yeah, but are we now? No, no. I don't like that. I like your first. Yeah, one. yeah, 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 yeah. Fair enough. I, I, I do sort of agree with you there, a little bit on the the fact that chaos wouldn't just go. Oh, we just we gave you two percent chaos. There you go. That's, that's all you needed to become a beastman, and we're not going to do any more to you because they'd be going hammer and tongs with them. They'd just be like, ah, oh, have this and have some wings, but they're only on your eyeballs and have some claws, but they're, you know, only on your eyeballs. Within your gun. Only on your eyeballs. Just a very particular guy, just obsessed with the eyeballs. Probably Malal, I'd, I'd say. Just for, yeah, I come up with the loser. best ideas. What a loser. <laughs> um, but yeah, I. I. When I look at Beastmen, I think we can come to sometimes get constrained by the idea that the miniatures guide the way that we look at the actual range or the, the scope of what the Beastmen could be. So for me, Beastmen could be any kind of beast. And so this is where I sort of have a bit of a divergence to that where, you know, Chaos is only influencing about 2%, but they could have, you know, you could have half lizard, half man, technically still a beastman half tiger half man and I, I think in warhammer fantasy they have the nation of ind or something which is you know some really some law that really isn't fleshed out all that much and they had sort of these half tiger half man type type creatures so for me the beastman is like could be multiple levels of beastman and you see that even within the warhammer fantasy range of beastman you have you know, your Ungors, your Centigors, your um, Minotaurs, the Cygors, all these different types that are existing. Yes, they all probably have a very similar type of design and look to them, but they all still variations on top of that original idea of goat-headed, you know, hoofed beastmen. So I think the, the, the idea that maybe the warp has touched them and it, it just it maybe hasn't been able to keep a strong connection to the Beastmen in the Warhammer 40,000 universe, or perhaps that that warp energy that went into the first tribes of Beastmen has actually made them somewhat immune to it. It's kind of like having a vaccine. You have a little bit yeah. of it, and you're like, oh, I'm a bit sick from it, but, oh, actually, it's made me a bit, a bit stronger and a bit more resilient to this warp energy that's touching me. So... I don't know. Like, I mean, that's that's going down the chaos, the chaos influence pathway, but I guess from a, a Necromunda point of view, where we assume that there's not that heavy chaos influence, you would have to say that it is what we were talking about earlier about smashing all these different types of genetics together to create this creature, and then you end up with something that breeds sustainably and 
is is still usable as something that you can communicate with, but something you can also get off to go off and plow the fields and so forth. Okay, so I have a bone to pick with you. Uh, oh, okay. You just mentioned the um, oh, was it the Kingdom of Ind? And remember the yes. the tiger headed ones. Man, yes. they were awesome. That's like old school. It is. Oh, it's very, like, very what, old like school. Like fourth or fifth edition. Oh, uh, they were never even really created. They were just. No, no, they were, they were mentioned. A, they were mentioned. It was a concept. Yeah, oh, a concept. Yeah. yeah, I think that there might have been a miniature here or there, but they, but that that that's when 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 that notion came about. It sort of changed my idea of what a beastman could be. You know, it's it's very linear in in the way it is now, and it makes sense. You want to, you know, you don't want to have ten thousand different variations of what the basement could be. You want to try and keep it linear because on the tabletop you want to see your forces like that. But from a law point of view, the idea that you could have basement built around almost any kind of beast of burden or yeah, any kind of yes. any kind of strong creature or any creature that survives its particular environment and then is humanoided it it truly depends on uh okay so going back to the sort of creation of beastmen um and i i mentioned this movie a lot since doing this podcast but the island of dr moreau where he is creating the human animal hybrids um is is that the movie with uh russell crowe Russell Brand. Russell Brand. Uh, I always get those played chances, played uh, Doctor Moreau. That's right. Um, yes. Yeah. It was it was a risky choice by the director who was a, a young <laughs> Kurt Russell, um, if, if I remember correctly. <laughs> and you but, don't. You might and I don't, don't remember that. <laughs> um, but was it Martin Sheen? No, it wasn't. I'm not doing this joke. Um, but I, if if it's like if you get to a, a a tropical planet where basically the planet is um, rainforests. You know, it's it's humid, it's wet, and the dominant species just happen to be saurians. Where mm. all of a sudden the beasts are created there for the the, the species with jobs. Um, <laughs> they they may be lizard beastmen, whereas you know three planets over where it's it's very marshy, it's very wet, it's um, basically like uh, Ireland dialed up to a 14. Um, yeah. You know, you may have frog beastmen. Like, you yeah, know, more amphibian type. They're, they're, yeah. They've crossbred humans with amphibians. Mm, and yeah. I love where you're going with this, where it's just like, well, yeah, on Necromunda especially, they're, and this sort of goes back to where I go, mind wise as a as a uh, servant race yeah. the beastmen may have been imported to necromunda as workers maybe they were the precursor to the goliath yes yes yeah maybe they were you the get me. yeah you yeah get they, me. let's put beastmen here and then the beastmen just go we we can rule this we yeah, can own they're, this and they're es- they're escaping cuz they've got that not that rock cunning. They have an animalistic cunning, and yeah. they're getting away. They, you know, they escape into the underhive, never to be seen again until you need them <laughs> as a bad horror. guy. Yeah. Um, but that's what they're doing there, and yep. that's that's how I'm looking at it. Like the the origins of the beastmen make so much more sense as a race of created servants. Now, that being said. Um, but you it, really have to step away. If you're going to have that mindset of them in the Imperium, you really have to step away from a lot of what we are told about Beastmen across all systems of GW games is that, absolutely. you know, the chaos touch. And I, I, again, it's something that we do, and I, I'll, I'll try and find the artwork, but the artwork from the, the Beastmen Army book, I'm going to say 5th edition and where it shows the birth of the Beastmen is some of the most incredible artwork. Like, it's so visceral and so... Is it the guy on... tearing it himself? Yeah, and his spine's yes. basically ripping oh, out and so man. forth. And that's the creation of, of these men becoming beast men. And when you see something like that, 
and it, it shows you a true visual of what has happened. It, it's very hard to abide by the idea that they're, you know, mixed together in a test tube and then gestated, where there, there's, there's something, I don't know, something really rock and roll, something really metal about them actually forming out of humans. You know, yeah. and then then going off and breeding, then going off and becoming these creatures of terror. You mean just like the Goliaths? Because uh, <laughs> life uh, finds a way. Yes, but yes. Well, much much like those early Goliaths, in temperament as well as appearance, these ab humans are often bestial and possess a reputation for crudity, aggression, and bad discipline much like Manvent co-hosts. Now, starting in the late 30th millennium, beastmen were often recruited into the ranks of the Imperial Army as part of the massive galactic expansion of the burgeoning Imperium during the Great Crusade, which began after about 798 of M30. Beastmen in the Imperial Army were regarded as highly useful, if not undisciplined warriors, and were ideal for suicidal assaults where brawn rather than tactical intellect was required. And that's just what we said before. The regiment's yeah. going to advance, but you know what? Get the beastie boys. You know, you're going to mm. fight for your right to exist in this Imperium. Yeah. And you you are <laughs> rolling 30 or 40 ranks deep. I thought you'd like that. And I just got it. I was you're, clever. <laughs> you're taking the enemy lines before anyone else gets close. And it's right there in black oh, you would and even, white. Like, you'd even they, mock up some sort of, like, you know, uh, story or some sort of award for them. You know, you're going to get to claim this and you get to claim this and, you know, we'll, we'll put your banner on the, on the top of the flagship and, you know, basically encourage them to go forward and just say, you'll be, you'll be considered best gore, you know, number one gores. And... They'd just be braying and going, oh, we're going yep. for this. But at the end of the day, they're using them purely as frontline cannon fodder. Yeah, except there's going to be one. Um, I'm just imagining this Gore and um, uh, we're going to call him Tim Gore. Tim Gore. Oh my God. I was looking for something. <laughs> they're getting like Gormley. But <laughs> Tim Gore Gormley. Uh, Private <laughs> Gormley is it? Private Tim Gore, as he's known. Um, falling in love with like uh, a female discipline master and he's just he's just constantly bringing her stuff like dead vermin or um <laughs> like you know he sees the discipline master in the middle of the battlefield and she's getting fought back by some you know soldier from some foolish planet that's decided to know where the real terror and as this as this guy's going to bayonet her tim gore just gets up there and just absolutely beats this guy to death with his own face. Yeah. And yeah. the discipline master's like fallen over and he reaches out and he picks her up and he's like, he just gives her like a grunt and she gives him like a nod and his heart just grows two sizes. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> he goes, that's and, it. I think we're married now. <laughs> yeah. It's like, according to the will, the will of my people, you're, you're now my mate. And uh, he's immediately like just blazooged to the face. Because there's no such thing as a happy ending for a beastman because oh. they are scum. And oh, um, this discipline oh. master's just like, I was going to shoot him basically once I stood up for touching me, but, you know, that was oddly convenient. I, I do know <laughs> that that example is one of the stories that inspired Horatio Valentino to take on the life that he leads now. The, the, the love heard, story of Tim Gore. I heard a rumour of Horatio Valentino that once he hooked up with a gene stealer patriarch and now all the offspring are actually tiny four-armed Horatio Valentinos. That is actually really cute, like little halfling yeah. size gene stealer. Halfling size gene stealer. Oh my God, the he, gang idea. Yeah, he infected the hive mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> gang idea. Gang That's going to come in for the Horatio Valentino Ab Humans episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm actually going to go into our next little informative bit because it's very relative to what we're talking about and then we can sort of talk more about the, uh, the basement as troops on the battlefield. Other Imperial troops disliked them intently as they were quite rowdy, unsanitary and generally unpleasant 
for baseline humans to deal with. So they're Are Americans. talking about you, Sam? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. I win. Shut up. Yeah. No, you know what? I'm going to delete my comment because I'm, once again, I'm alienating huge sections of our audience. Um, <laughs> shout out to American listeners. You know it's true. But yes, no, they're talking about me. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah, I've lost my place here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Following the events of the galactic wide civil war known as the Horus Heresy, that little kerfuffle, and the subsequent restructuring of the Imperial Armed Forces by the Ultramarines Legion Primarch, Rubert Gulliman, according to the dictates of his magnum opus, the Codex Astartes, during the time of rebirth, Beastman regiments retained in the newborn Astra Militarum, where they were often led by the largest and most powerful of their kind, known as Pack Masters. Hell they yes. mean Imperial Guard, by the way. But they are that they are starting to create almost like a a foothold within the Imperium for themselves. You know, and when once you get that that once you've actually got some sort of stability within the Imperial Army or the sorry, Astra Militarum, then you can you take for example the Ratlings and the Ogrins, the two most famous type. They are a required and very functional part of the Astra Militarum. Yes. And we're starting to see that that even a Legion Primarch would go Hang on, we need them. We we need them for our Imperium. Don't get rid of don't get rid of these. Yeah. They have a use within the mm. industry that is our existence right now. Especially after the Horus Heresy, where yeah. let's be honest, half of these beastmen regiments that existed during the Crusade, etc., would have sided with the Arch Trader Horus. They would have gone that way. And yeah. Ogrins would have gone that way, Rattlings would have gone that way, etc., etc. It would have been split down the middle, but even Gulliman, you know, King Blueberry himself, is looking at this and saying, no, no, they have a place within our company. They have yeah. a place that they they need to occupy because no one will do it better than them. And we just lost half of our troops. Like, that's what, that's the main thing for me is that they would be sitting there going that the the Horus Heresy for for the best part is over. You know, with with the death of Horus, we you know he's done. But the all the gains of the Great Crusade are just absolutely gone. And you could have a shattered Imperium if you don't go and reclaim it sooner rather than later. And you're not going to be able to reclaim that if you spend generations trying to build up your forces again. You need to be on the front foot, c taking as many planets as you can, bringing them back to within in compliance. And if that compliance looks like a goat-headed psycho running at the enemy lines, then that's what it's going to need to look like at that time and place. And you, when you talk about the industry that they're existing in at the time, their industry right then and there is war. And their, their outcome is a better Imperium, which obviously they don't achieve a better Imperium, but they just certainly make it more stable. So the, the requirement and the need of the beastmen becomes really important. And this is what I was talking about earlier with your, what do you call them, snuffers, sniffers? My uh, uh, snuffies. Snuffies, yeah, it's just not a great name. The, the, it's the, awesome. Uh, oh, okay. okay. And then I think it's awesome too. You happy? I am. <laughs> but when the Imperium needs it, it it'll make condition for these for these abhumans. Even if they're even if there's something that the Imperium has created themselves and they say, Oh well, you know, this is not working out for us. This is not this is too far gone from our concept of humanity, they will make condition and they will make tolerances for it to allow it to get to be exploited at that period of time to get the most out of it and then come through and wipe them out. But my idea is that there's always going to be survivors. So survivors who would probably still love the Imperium and just would see that what has been done to them is more of a misunderstanding rather than uh, an attempted genocide. I think it depends a lot on their... Uh... 
upbringing's the wrong word. Um, their upbringing. I'm just going to use upbringing. So yep. uh, we know that those beastmen who have been introduced to the Imperial cult by the missionaries of the Adeptus Ministorum possess a simple but fierce devotion to the Emperor of Mankind and regard him as a vengeful god who demands tribute in the form of the blood of his enemies. These fanatically religious beastmen are driven by the need to atone for their original sin of being born mutants by fighting in the service of the emperor. All right? Juxtaposition of that, those beastmen who have been introduced to worshipping the chaos gods by missionaries of the gods of chaos possess a simple but fierce devotion to their selected god and regard him as a vengeful deity who demands tribute in the form of the blood of his enemies. These fanatically religious beastmen are driven by the need to atone for their original sin of being born by fighting in service to their god. You change a couple of words, yeah, and it yeah, gives right. you two very different creatures where... Um, oh, I think it was the I'm pretty sure it was Goliath episode where I mentioned the unfleshed from the uh, um, Dead Sky Black Sun books uh, the yeah, Iron yeah. Warriors yeah. Yep. Um, the unfleshed fought against the Iron Warriors because they were they were originally children kidnapped from Scholar Progenums and um, put in the, to the Dima Calaba and uh, basically rapidly grown into um, Trader Astartes, whereas they yep. still loved the Emperor. That was always in their brains. Yeah. Um, yep. Yep. Whereas these beastmen, if you get them young, get them dumb, you can teach them anything and they're just like, nope, that's the truth. So if you get yep. them and you're like, the Emperor loves you, the Emperor wants you to fight for him because you're a bad mutant and the only way you can make the Emperor love you is by killing his enemies because you're a bad mutant. And these beastmen are like, I'm going to go shank someone for the Emperor <laughs> right now. Whereas you turn around and be like, hey, my dude, you want to go get some blood for the blood god? Skulls for the skull throne? It's like, okay. Yeah, that, cool. that makes that makes total sense to me because that is what I know and what I practice. But you said something there about the, the sin of being born. Yes. That's very interesting. You can you can almost see that the beastmen are torn in in their world. Do you know? Oh, Where, absolutely. Like they, they would be shunned by so much of humanity, they would want to be part of it, but then when they're given the opportunity to, you know, kill in the name of the blood god or kill in the name of the chaos gods, then they they have an opportunity to embrace something that's embracing them. But they'd have to turn against everything that they should probably be able to know and integrate with. So there's a real sort of, there's almost a real sort of sadness to the beastmen here, you know. Whereas the Ogren are, you know, them turning to chaos is just more of a corruption. Whereas the beastmen turning is more sort of pick which side is going to hate you least almost. It's not even. It's, I have a point about Ogren, and I'm going to come back to that. But with the Beastmen, I think it's very much so. Um, every movie from the early '90s about how gangs uh, indoctrinate kids into joining them, they give them a family. They find what's missing. They, the drive, the protection. You know, the feeling of being loved. Um, that's what, if you convince a beastman that you love them, you'll protect them. And all they have to do is kill the enemies of your chosen deity. They're all for it because they yeah. they now have something that they've been specifically told. You don't deserve this. Yeah, like, true. And, yeah. Or, and that sort of thing there. But an interesting thing about Ogrins, and I want to talk about this in the episode we eventually do about Ogrins. Way back in like Rogue Trader, um, Groups of Ogrens would routinely be discovered by orcs. And these Ogrens would just be convinced that they were big, pink orcs. And they would oh. join orc warbands basically as bodyguards to, like, the war bosses and high-ranking members. Because they were typically bigger and stronger than orcs. But 
they'd just been told before the missionaries got to them, nah, man, you're an orc now. And they'd be like, okay. And so they would run That's around like, with cool. these orc war bands. So yeah. what's to say your Escher gang haven't, uh, you know, jacked up a, a transport flight of, uh, you know, beastmen with jobs? And these <laughs> beastmen who are children, like, you know, remember, they are born. They can just be children. Um, I think they're known as kids. <laughs> You're right. No, I'm not laughing at that. I'm not <laughs> laughing at that. Damn you. Uh, Trent, if you're still listening to this episode, buddy, industry. 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 <laughs> um, that was a great joke. Um, but, yeah, like, what's to say these Escher... Maybe not Escher, unless they're... No, they're a girl beastman, so they capture these girl beastmen. Or, and they... Beastman man vents. Oh, okay. And they <laughs> teach the, the male beastmen, no, no, you work with the man vents. You do the heavy lifting. You help them. And these female beastmen, they're like, no, no. Sister, you're one of us now. You know, you start oh. seeing these these be- female beastmen in Escher gang. And they'll be really away from the major hives. They'll be... Those real rural cousin types, like, oh, no, 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 no. We're holding gang ideas till the end. Go on. I need to, I, I can't wait to the end. Go on. Okay. Me. I've got one. What if a roaming corridor preacher discovers, like, a group of beastmen that have somehow become lost on Necromunda and that. And this preacher's just like, you know, in the name of the emperor, I'm going to destroy you evil mutants. And yep. right before he gets one of them, one of the gores is like, who's the emperor? And this Cordor's just like, wait, what? And they're like, <laughs> who's, who's the emperor? Tell us about the emperor. Cause these gores aren't attacking him. Cause they're, they're, they're young. They're kids. Uh, yeah. And this court or preacher is just starts telling them about the emperor and that, and they're just like, and you serve the emperor? And this preacher's like, yeah. And he goes, do you want to serve the emperor? And they're like, can we? Yeah, and this, this preacher, great. This yeah. preacher starts basically going like, yeah, you know, if you help me kill the enemies of the emperor, when you die, you'll go, you'll sit at the emperor's side, you'll, you'll eat a meal with the emperor, and they're just like, Whoa, there are meals involved? Listen, <laughs> we are in. So I'm going to call these guys uh, the Corgors. And uh, was that gang idea just for that name? It feels like it was. No, no, no. no. I literally, I was just thinking about it. Then I'm like, what if oh, okay. like, a bunch of Cordor <laughs> found... And I just came up with the name, the Corgors. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like do them as beastmen in all these robes with like real crude feral weapons led by this 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 missionary type who's just leading this this mutant band in suicidal attacks but he just keeps winning and so right so he's just using he's just like they need to die but i'm yeah. going to have them die in service of the emperor we're yeah. going to go on holy missions but he's doing well That's and these awesome. and these renegade corridor gangs are just like these renegade corridor gangers are like Listen, man, I want to, like, I'm loving what you're doing. I want to sign up. Like, I want to help you. And he's yeah. just like, yeah, I kind of need some more humans with me. Yeah, let's go. And, but you'll have these beastmen who are super fanatically mm. connected to the emperor yeah. through this preacher. And their, like, their faith would have that real life consequence of, you know, those faith dice are rolling. Their belief, yeah. because they're. Yeah. Because a place in Necromunda, that prayer is so intrinsically connected to the warp, they would yeah. actively be creating a difference on the battlefield. Right. God damn, damn it! Um, this gang idea is awesome. Um, that is actually freaking cool. Like, I mean, it doesn't tell much, take much to sell me down the pathway of religious gangs, but that is freaking bonkersly awesome. It's like, like you're 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 actively going against the corridor, but. Yeah. For the corridor. Yeah, 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 exactly. So you're you're taking them and you're going, we need to fight against, you know, not not necessarily fight against the ideology of the corridor, but fight against perhaps some 
you know, rogue elements of the court or the ones that aren't doing the the, the work of Big E quite the way exactly. that this, this preacher sees it and says, I'm going to use these shock troops of mine to change the perspective, change the concept. That's because we awesome. already know um, the the underhive mentality of mutants are mutants are accepted yes. to a certain degree yep. as long as you're not mm-hmm. like um, what was it the grey ooze that killed yeah. the uh, the edge lord yeah. um, and finally stopped that dank mean super highway yes that's it but like as long as you're not just like you know eight faced Bill you know like. People in the yeah. underhive aren't going to care. They're going to look at you and just be like, oh, yeah, like, he's got an extra hand. But what was it, the, the Goliath with the extra hand? He can uh, drive and drink a beer at the same time. <laughs> um, no one's going to care if you're slightly mutated because it's the underhive, man. It happens. And mm. you're going to see ab humans. Um, we know uh, the, the Daglo dragons, uh, the Vansar gang have... Uh, Rattling and Beastman members. I believe they have Beastman members. I know they have Rattlings. Yeah, um, okay. Yep. But, like, we know there are ab humans around. We know that it's going to be happening. So, ab humans in the Underhive isn't going to be, like, a far, like, far-reaching thought there. But, but it's, it's not something that the Underhivers would consider as... I'm not going to say uncommon, but something that they should be wary of because they would be so understanding and so used to what mutation is about, you know, mm. and if, if they can have something that resembles a discussion with this beastman, they're going to go, well, that's better than the towel that tried to bite my face off in my yep. bathroom. So yeah. I can accept that as a creature here more than I can accept some millisaur or some other, you know, non-sentient being that's going to just try and eat me. Or some beast that crawls up with nine eyes and three mouths and is trying to yeah. consume babies. Like, yeah. you, you're going to look at the beast and be like, hey, man, you cool? He's just like, yeah, I'm just I'm just enjoying my beer. I'm yeah. probably going to get a sandwich later. Be like, that's cool, man. You do you. But I, I think that's great because gangs gangs are going to be used to fighting other people. But this corridor, these um the the Corgors, mm. when they show up, you hear that I'm just picturing um the the beastman braying those yeah uh, yeah. It, the it almost reminds me of like um the Urukai those war cries oh, that they yes. have and yeah. you know you imagine this this gang of I don't know Orlocks and they're going you know what the hell is that noise it's like mate I'm not I I'm I'm not comfortable right now what is that and it's just all of a sudden you hear the like and it's of someone running past real quick and it's like what is this and then next thing you know you've got these beastmen leaping from gantries and yeah you know they're getting in there swinging these double-handed clubs and you know just huge serrated hunks of metal and you might kill eight nine ten eleven of them but there's just more and more and more because we don't know how much they've been breeding down there. You know, mm. you'll you'll have literal herds of yeah, these yeah. beastmen that are just being, well, hold on, the big ones in our herd are all following this weird human in the red dress. Uh, if the big ones thinks he's saying the right thing, I've, oh, what's that? Whoa, someone's mentioning meals? Oh, and there's a guy <laughs> named the Emperor involved? Cool. Yeah, but how many courses to this meal? If it's just a meal, yeah, no, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Count me, sign me up. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm all hooves in. Yeah. yeah, I'm all hooves in. Put your right hoof in, put your right hoof out. You know what <laughs> yeah. I'm saying? Um, you know, classic uh, children's song down in the hill. Catra, classic yeah. And it's just those poor, those poor bastard uh, Goliaths, those three Goliaths just sitting there like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, just... Is one of you going to drive us home? We are still not there. Like, come yeah. on. <laughs> Surely one of you beastmen must know the way. Surely. But, uh, I guess, look, I mean, that's, that's, that's talking about how they exist in Necromunda. As it, it, I, I feel like they would be more accepted, but across yes. the Imperium at large, 
we know that that acceptance pretty, pretty much shifts away once they've been tapped out for the, the Great Crusade. You know? Yeah, the Imperium and kind of sucks for this. It does, yeah. So in recent centuries, there's been a political shift within the Imperium and beastmen are no longer seen in Imperial military service. No doubt more Puritan elements of the Inquisition, the Departmento Minotaurum that beastmen could not be so radically different from the genetic human baseline without having been in some way affected by the taint of chaos. In the 41st millennium, beastmen are now classified as mutants and as a result are the subject of severe imperial persecution and have been placed on the register of proscribed citizens, class AG worlds, by the Adeptus Arbites, or the Arbos, as they should be and will be known. Yes. So this is exactly what we're talking about, about the concept, what we mentioned earlier about the concept of them being heavily afflicted by chaos and the the mindset of the Imperium changing to be like that. But I'm going to relate this more to Necromunda. I don't think, and we just mentioned it, I don't think Necromundans would see them as this. They would just no. see it as another mutation that has happened. When they're fighting alongside the Chaos Halot gangs, then the the local Necromundans would be like, actually, all the propaganda makes sense. They are worshippers of Chaos. You know? yeah. And or that makes total maybe those sense. Ones were, maybe those ones from that dome over there turned to Chaos. But, oh, no, I don't, I don't see it as that. I see it as once, once they're fighting on the side of the Chaos for, Halot forces... That would then change the mindset of those Necromundans and all beastmen. Do you remember all those gangs coming together during the Aranthian succession? Yes. Gangs who hated each other. You know, they gangs who had blood feuds against each other. When the enemy was outside the gates, everyone inside turned to each other and went, we're cool. I see that happening here as well, where those chaos gangs are coming up. During the Aranthian succession. Those chaos gangs are coming and basically going, we've got our own beastmen, we've got our mutants and scavies, etc., etc. And you're going to have beastmen inside those settlements that are sort of looking around at everyone on the walls with them going, no, no, I've got to fight harder to prove I love the emperor, not the bad gods. Oh, I I agree with that that scenario. The scenario I'm talking about is a handful of Orlocks sitting together and they're saying, well, I fought this particular Chaos Warband and they were doing some weird mumbo-jumbo and reeling off these prayers and another one will say, well, I fought there a different type. I Well, I fought the same one and we saw Beastmen with them. So in our mind now, okay. all, the pro- the, all the propaganda that's come down the line, it, it's true. The Beastmen are actually manifestations of chaos and we shouldn't be having we shouldn't be involving ourselves with them so in these times of you know i guess less stress you would call it if there could be a scenario in necromunda like yeah, that I'm picking they up. would be turning on the bed not turning on them and trying to kill them or anything like that but they'd certainly be giving uh, uh, a message to the arbos and saying there are beastmen that run this particular trade route or beastmen that you know, run on these haulers or whatever the case might be, and we know them because we're interacting with them all the time. We don't want to interact with them anymore because we know they're afflicted by the ca- the yeah. taint of chaos. And it, it you know, it, it's tantamount to sort of a racism, I guess. You know, where they just go, they just need that one little spark to ignite their fire to go. Now, now we can use we can use the arbos to take out a rival, and then we can take what they have. And I could see yeah. that happening on Necromunda. So, I see what you're saying now. Yeah, this this edict that comes from the Imperium, the way it would affect Necromunda is that gangs would use that as a tool to isolate and destroy basement gangs purely to take over their industry. So what the... <laughs> what are you laughing about? <laughs> uh, to take over what was it? Uh, their industry. Ah, so, excellent. Yeah. So, what you would, what they would have here is the classic Necromunda thing of find a weakness, exploit it, take over, and they would be using this. They'd go, okay, now all basement are chaotic, and whatever we do to get rid of that chaos taint, 
we're going to get a, a nice shiny pat on the head for and the Imperium is going to come down and bless us for this. Well, it's interesting you say what you've said there because now that they have been classified as mutants as opposed to abhumans, this effectively precludes them from settlement on or transportation to or from more than 300,000 worlds of the Imperium and forbids their conscription as part of an Imperial Tithe obligation. All of this is a sure sign that they may lose their official abhuman status completely and be reclassified as true mutants. These creatures are often hunted down during anti-mutant programs conducted by the Arbos on those worlds where populations of beastmen are known to exist. This persecution, of course, has led many beastmen to seek protection in the service of chaos, thus in effect producing a self-fulfilling prophecy. Unfortunately, go. one of the primary industries of the Imperium is hypocrisy. <laughs> we don't want uh, beastmen to serve chaos, so we're going to hunt them down, so they're going to seek refuge with the forces of chaos, which proves that they all serve chaos. Exactly. No, yeah. we we literally rounded up a regiment we had of beastmen and went like shotgun crazy on them. And now a bunch of them have fled to the opposite lines of this planet we were currently in the middle of a war on and are now fighting for our enemies, the traitors in service to the Chaos Gods. Um it must have been their plan the whole time. It's not like they were all screaming, No, we love the Emperor. Yeah. Uh, you know, and they were saving discipline masters until that blazooka hit got them. Um, but this is what I'm talking oh. about: the sadness of the beastmen. You know, this is this is the the melancholy story for them: is that they are driven off by the Imperium, and who doesn't? Who's to say that the forces of chaos are going to accept them? Uh, you were you were butchering our troops a week ago, so guess what we're going to do with you, all of you. You're all going to become sacrifices. You're we'll going to be a meat shield. Well. well, not even that. They just take them on board and sacrifice them to the dark gods. We'd much rather summon demons with your blood, your big E worshipping blood, than uh, have you fight alongside us because yeah. we don't we don't even regard you as the blessed creatures of chaos. We just simply simply see you as the the pawns of the Imperium, or at worst, you were the creatures of chaos that allowed yourself to become tainted by the 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 the, the imperial creed and that that's what i say like they they're actually genuinely a sad case where they're stuck in the middle they need they need to have a side and they they don't have a side the beastmen in my opinion they they don't have a, fa- a, a an ability they don't have a home really yeah chaos to the left of me emperor to the right here i yeah. am being sacrificed to summon demons <laughs> in the middle with you. Um, yeah, no, is it that... sucks. It genuinely sucks for them. Uh, but it is once again uh, proof that neither the Imperium nor Chaos are the, you know, the good guys. I totally agree with that. I totally... For this particular case, there is no good guy for the Beastmen because... and. It, if they had not been originally conscripted into the armies of the Great Crusade or, you know, the armies after the, after the Horus Heresy, then you could say, okay, well, at least the Imperium had always drawn a line for them. But the, the line for them has always been grey and blurry. And that's why many beastmen worship the Chaos Gods. You know, that's, a, that's why they, they, they have to ally with that side, even if they don't want to. And that, to me, is really sad as well. That they, they, they don't have a choice here. It's it's almost like gun to the head stuff. But either, either, either way, I think the choice is they they are told what their choice is. It's oh well, you know what's uh from Star Wars uh, Rogue One. Uh, you're being rescued. Please stop resisting or something yeah, like that. Yeah, you know yeah, 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 these yeah. uh 
you know, either the missionaries get to them and, well, sorry, the missionaries get to them and whether it's a missionary of uh, the Imperium saying you love the Emperor, it's a missionary of the Chaos God saying you love, insert God here, it's a missionary of the Tau Empire, uh, it's a missionary of the Orcs, like, you know, who knows? Uh, probably not the Orcs, they'd probably just kill them. No, um, I reckon that would be a fantastic brawl. I could see the, the the lads going. All right, mate, you've done a, you've put in a good slug. You can join us. Jump on board with those ogrins over there. You know, they're yeah, just big yeah. versions it's just of ogrins and basemen. Just being like, what are you guys doing? Yep, <laughs> yeah, yep. And just oh. these three Goliaths just nodding, going, just three Goliaths. Oh, we don't know mm. how we got here. Mm. <laughs> mm. Some Van Sarchik was gonna take us to a meal, <laughs> and then we saw a big like chair. And she exploded, and now we're here. Um, I don't want to scream I mean, help, but I'm I'm right on the brink of it, baby. I'm right there. <laughs> and one of them just keeps taking off his glasses with the fake mustache attached, and just and wiping the lenses. But there's no lenses. <laughs> He's just. Yep. I think I'm the war boss. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I love I love the concept of. Uh, these veteran abhuman regiments, or these these abhumans within regiments that have proven themselves time and time again, where maybe these arbites or even like you know punishment battalions and that have sent emissaries to these regiments and saying, "Hey, all your abhumans are now seen as mutants. You got to get rid of them." And the commanders of these regiments just looking at them and going like. No. no. Yeah, but then the commissars looking at the commanders and going, yes. Yeah, but I, you can just imagine the... Oh, there's got to be a story somewhere that someone could write where it's this commander basically says to these guys, like, mate, not going to happen. The commissar sort of looks over and, you know, then you've got the command squad looking at the commissar and everyone's just like, you know... It, everything's just balanced on the the head of that needle and eventually someone just pulls the gun and just pop 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 and all of a sudden that regiment is you know they're a mercenary band now where they're just like <gasps> that's you sick. know nah, this we're we're done we're heading to the eastern fringe you know we've yeah. we've we're taking control of the ship um yeah. they've convinced the navigator hey man you're you're a mutant too Oh, no, like, they just tell them orders have come through. We've got a ship off to here because you convince oh, the whole yeah. regiment. Like we, the com- company commander says, we and these particular abhumans they need to come with us because we're going on a special mission that needs their their particular skill set. Let's boot regiment idea, regiment idea, rogue trader, <sighs> yes. who is they- just hap- he just happened to be there, and the the um, the company commander knew that this rogue trader was on the planet for some reason and has just sort of said, listen, I've gotten orders that this, these squads, this platoon of beastmen who have served loyally need to be killed. Now, you are heading off to the Eastern Fringe or you're heading across to the Imperium, uh, what is it, Imperium Secundus? Secundus, the... yeah. Nihilus? No, Nihilus. Nihilus. You're heading Nihilus, over to yeah. the Imperium Nihilus. Hmm. You need soldiers, I need these soldiers gone. You picking up what I'm putting down. And this rogue trader is just like, send them in. And so you've got them, you've got like navy breaches, you've got maybe like a a failed aspirant assassin, and you're building up an army around this, like you'd have stripped back Lamb and Russ, almost like the, uh, was it the Steg 4 tanks? That were used by the Erdeshi troops in the Gaunt's Ghost series. Um, oh, you're testing my memory with this one. Oh man, I've got it's Steg set. Four in my brain. Yeah, but I, I totally get what you mean. Uh, tanks that are stripped back, like you know, as long as the cannon fires, as long as the heavy bolters are ripping, we don't we don't mess with las cannons on these. But we yeah. we we put heavy bolters and we just maintain fire until we can get that battle cannon kicking. Yes, everything else is stripped back. Front armor plating to the nines, rear armor plating, mate. Just, just hope you don't get shot. Cardboard, mate. cardboard. 
<laughs> just paint it dark. Yeah, yeah, this rogue trader's just like, mate, I'm a rogue trader. My 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 warrant of trade goes back to, you know, when the God Emperor wore short pants. Like, <laughs> I can, I, to to I can do what I. It's a piece of paper that says I can do what I want. Send the beastmen over to me. I'm just going to tell people I requisitioned them. I'll get yeah. my uh, my peons to write the paperwork for you. I'm going to backdate those bad boys for, uh, you know, a month ago before this order came in. And uh, how about you send over a couple of uh, chimeras while you're at it? You know what I'm saying? And the yeah. company commander's just like, fair trade, you take them. And, like, you just, yeah, just... But- I think to take on those beastmen, the beastmen would still have to feel like they're fighting for the Imperium. They'd be you know, told. They'd, they'd yeah. just be told, you know, you're, yeah. you've got your orders. Yeah, you're, you're attached go to this road trader. This man. Yeah. yeah, so you couldn't go off and do anything too crazy with them, but you'd have to be doing missions where they, they believe in what they're doing. You know what I mean? So oh. that, that's so cool. That is such a brilliant idea for a regiment. But... I mean, you could almost do it in Nec- a Necromunda setting as well. You have a rogue trader with a bodyguard of beastmen, and these are the are the units. You know, these these are massive things. You know, I maybe- forgot this was a Necromunda podcast. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh man, but like f- like fully muscled out, huge hulking things. And if he's ever questioned, it's just like here's. I'm a rogue trader and my send my family name stretches back so many hundreds of years. Don't even don't even try to come and question me, you know. Unless the, the chapter master of the Imperial Fist is coming down from his little boo. boo coming down from his little uh, turkey's nest. He there is nobody here who can question me and my four ginormous beastmen bodyguard. And the way I, actually the way I just popped into my head now, the way I'd see them because you would want not to have that, you know, the obviously guttural type of communication they would have. Do you remember from Rogue One again, where you have, uh, oh, I can't think of his name, Krennic. Krennic, who is the main bad guy, and he has the death troopers with him. And the way they communicate yes. with each other, it's like a static sort of like... <laughs> that's the way the basemen would communicate with each other, and that's the way the... Um, the rogue trader would communicate with them. They would be cool. They'd make an awesome end boss. Damn, but I'm just anyway. thinking. No, I'm just picturing now these four just roided up, like mm. friends on collar. Yeah. Um, sort of like, um, do you remember the Bessigors from the Warhammer Fantasy range? Oh, yeah, They were the definitely. biggest. They had all the heavy mm. armor, those big double-bladed axes. Mm. Picture them done. And you know what? Done with the, uh, the jackals kit from the corn berserkers. Yeah. Just yep. with like beast legs. You'd still have them in the, like the pants, but just get oh. the hooves on the end. The big beast, best of all heads, those big rearing, like mm. they're yeah, shelling out their war cries, those big horns, just yep. pipes and that, and then just chain axes in each hand. Like, yeah, 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 exactly. Like, oh man. Huge cleavers, like just nasty looking pieces of work. They would be crazy, but look, I mean that 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 has sort of diverges a little bit yes. away from where we were Re-rail. talking about Re-rail. 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 about the the beastmen and how they actually worship chaos. So many beastmen worship cha- the chaos gods, and frequent the armies of the lost and the damned. Of those corrupted beastmen warriors, those that worship corn are known as blood gores. Those that worship zinch are known as zangors. Those that worship slanesh are known as slangors. I'm seeing a trend here. And those that worship Nurgle are known as Pestigors, trend breakers. Trend broken. Yeah. <laughs> there is also an unusually large and aggressive strain of giant beastmen known as Minotaur. It is it is comparable in strength to an Ogren. So So it's an Ogren beastman. Ogren beastman. But this is this is interesting when we start to talk about the next genus of what, what I mentioned earlier about all like how I consider all beastmen variations of the theme you know now we start to see minotaurs introduced into the world but i i agree and i disagree with minotaurs in the 40k world and i 
I almost okay. totally disagree with them in Necromunda. I don't think you're hiding a Minotaur in Necromunda. I think it's too much. I think you see an Ogren walking around, you go, big human guy. You see a Minotaur walking around on the streets or in the halls of Necromunda, you just go, this is clearly something that is not normal. It's clearly something that is suffering from corruption. Now, it, it's just too big. Okay. So, and I'm going to deny I ever said this. I agree with you 100% when it comes to Minotaurs on uh, Necromunda. I see that I'm recording this, so what I've just said is obviously going to be shared anyway. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I agree with you. I would see, instead of Minotaurs within Beastmen Warbands, just straight up Ogrens. Because yep. Ogrens, you know, whether they be the former prisoners with jobs type or just, you know, maybe um, uh, Astra Militarum Ogrens that got lost, whatever. Maybe Ogren bodyguards. Maybe there were some of those Lords of Aranthus that have somehow gotten loose and joined up with a bunch of uh, goat men. It is, it is so much more viable for them to just be like, ah, hello, tiny hairy man. Do you need a friend? It's like, yes, I do. do you guys, <laughs> I'm gonna let me. Can people stop talking to me? Can I finish my beer and then go and get a sandwich? And he's just like, <laughs> I love sandwiches. Um, I would see an Ogren, sort of like a renegade Ogren with a group of beastmen. Absolutely, a Minotaur. That's to the point of where even your pretty liberal Hiver is gonna be like. They call, not, they're calling triple zero. Yeah. I'm go, not, get the Arbos sorry. online, please. Yeah, what's it? Uh, 911 for the Americans. Um, and triple nine or something. Triple nine or something for, for the, our, uh, you know, our colonial brothers and sisters. <laughs> um, anyway, I don't know it's what an emergency else calls. Yeah, yeah, emergency. They're calling yeah. up the local enforcers and the local Actually, enforcers yeah. are just killing everyone. <laughs> on, the, on the Imperium, it's just E-E-E. Three it's A's. just E-E-E. Yeah. E-E-E. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that exactly my viewpoint. You see a Minotaur and you go, this is too much. We are, we are actually going to send in the flamethrowers and we are getting rid of yes. this this gang, this group. Even your uh, Corridor Preacher wouldn't be able to The Corridors aren't going to be able to sweep that under the rug. Exactly. It's just it's too much to handle. It's too yeah. big to hide. It's too big to hide. You get an Ogren and you strap some horns to him and you put a little funky little snout on him. Completely 100%. different. 100%. Yeah. You know, my Korgors... Okay, I have to start this game now. The Korgors are going to have an Ogren hmm. with just two massive mismatched horns Yeah, that have been like Viking helmet on yeah. like a hat for him. Yeah. And he'll just be like, I've got horns like my brothers and sisters. How cool is that? <laughs> And the preacher's just looking at him being like, God damn it, Grug. What is wrong with you? And all the, all the gores are just the like, Grug has got a great set of horns on him. I think he's our chieftain now. Yeah. yeah. Like, he's our number one. And then has boots that have got like shaped as hooves at the front. He's so. got hooves painted on the front of them. Yeah. Oh, man. Or he's wearing um, stilts. Yeah. He's walking around on stilts. He's got hooves on the bottom of them, and then um, just like ch- like charges, like lowers his head and charges every time into battle, thinking he's like this ancient minotaur that he's heard so much about. Like, oh, this was the promise being that you could become. You actually get to you eventually if you become strong enough, you go from being a gore or a beastman into a minotaur. And he's like, well, I'm the minotaur. I've become strong enough, and. I've been told that they charge headlong into combat. So that's all he does now. He's a very clever man. Oh, what is the... Um, what's the tunnel fighting tables called? I always forget Mortalis? this. Mortalis? Zone Mortalis. In Zone yes. Mortalis situations, he's just screaming the words, get out of my labyrinth. 
and just chasing people. And they're just like, what is going on? Come here, Jason. Who is Jason? Um, he read a book. Someone read a book around him once. All he remembered was Labyrinth and he didn't like Jason. Yeah. But, yeah. but the yeah. Jason thing was not relevant to the la- Labyrinth. That was something else completely. Was yeah. it not Jason in the Labyrinth? Oh, I don't know who it was. I just think it's was funny it- that he's just angry at any Jason. Yeah, he's just angry at Jason. Yeah. Um, but much like the Korgors, most beastmen are destined to become outcasts of Imperial society. They are shunned and are often hunted down and killed as the Imperium has little tolerance for any who deviate from the perfection of the baseline human form in mind or body. Mutation is considered a heretical crime against the Emperor by Imperial authorities because of its connection to sympathy with or worship of chaos. As creatures of the warp, these bestial warriors often fall to the service of chaos as members of the lost and the damned as a means of escaping persecution of imperial society or are lulled into the service of one of the four chaos gods due to their inherent nature as creatures of chaos. Now, whether their true origins are taken into account as being manipulations of chaos or however it is, there is no doubt that the ruinous powers look upon beastmen with special favour, and chaos gifts are often granted to those beastmen who become champions of chaos, even though they may serve no specific chaos god. Champions who do follow Korn, Nurgle, Slanesh, Zinch, or even Malal, or as he's also known, Malice, individually often benefit from the relationship more readily than human, heretic Astartes, or other mortal chaos champions, because they are closer to the true nature of chaos. Oh, 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 oh. Maybe, 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 maybe not. Like, <laughs> we've already discussed it. They're either yeah. a science project or a religious project. So, Or both. Or both, yes. Or both. But I, I think in, in the modern setting of 40K, they exist now within the full constraints of of the ruinous powers. But 40K is so large and so vast that you you can, as you say, have that platoon of beastmen who are fighting for the Imperium. You could still have regiments on the outer rims who are still fighting for the Imperium. The Imperium is a million worlds. Sorry. Yep. A million... Million, million like, worlds, isn't it? No, it's a million... There's a... Statistically, I believe there's uh, there's a thousand chapters of studies. Yeah. Each chapter Which is has a nonsense. thousand marines. Um, shout out to the Black Templars <laughs> um, and the Space Wolves and the Space Wolves. No and technically, yeah. the, the Lamenters only have like three marines left at any point. So, <laughs> um, but I think statistically, if every chapter sticks to the codex, there is a marine for every planet of the Imperium. Yeah. Right so there's a million worlds or a million habitations, etc. Um, less than a third of those beastmen cannot travel to or from. Okay. Now, do I believe there are beastmen on Terra? Absolutely. One hundred percent, there are beastmen on Terra. There Why? was a gene How? stealer. There was a gene stealer cult uprising on Terra. There would be. Ogrins that's a, that's and different. No, that's it's not. Different. No, it's not. There beastmen would be and gene stealers. Yep. No, I no. Tr- I genuinely believe there would be beastmen on Terra, in herds or clans or working in just stoking the fires that burn, you know, sacred oils to no. lead smoke out of temples. There would be beastmen there. I, I genuinely do believe not that. believe that. I I would for me they would be wiped out. They as soon as any edict came down the line that they are no good nicks, they are the the children of chaos, an inquisitor or even just a, an inquisitor in training would use that as an opportunity to show their devotion to the the emperor and go and have them all killed. I can't, I have to disagree. I think it's the the edict would be coming from the. The Arbos, absolutely, and it would go to all these different places, and they would go to certain parts of Terra, and 
I'm not saying they're in the Imperial Palace. I'm not saying they're in, you know, under the, the choir of the Astronomicon, whatever. I'm saying that there are going to be places that are forgotten about on Terra. That oh, chaos okay. that, that chaos cults or gene stealer cults or beastmen can exist. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Well, I'm that's not fine. I'm not saying that you're walking down the street on Terra and being like, hey, a custode. Hey, uh, a bunch of fallen, because they were definitely on Terra quite recently. And oh there, you know, there's just some people in that and oh look, there's three beastmen just chatting about life. No. Nothing. Like they're they're gonna be they're, there's three really big dudes in like coveralls and metal chess pieces with that guy's got a great mustache. Um, you know. Okay, no, but didn't you say like you could see them burning sacred fires and all that? I, I think in in any sort of formal capacity, they would not exist. They are they are they do not you have a place. You need to remember the there are levels of like Terra is a hive world. Yeah, and eventually leading to the pinnacle of humanity being the Imperial Palace, and there would be. You know, we've got so many different references through so many different books where just regular hives, Armageddon, for example, there there are tribes of people whose entire existence is to ensure a fire doesn't go out. So they get fuel and throw it into this fire and keep the fire burning. And the, the heating that it provides goes to an entirely dead section of a hive. There's no one there. But no one's told the people 40 levels below that have to keep the fire stoked. Right. Okay. So I'll change my statement in regard to what you said then. I agree with you that there's beastmen on, on terror. However, if they were known about, they would be killed. They would be wiped out. Okay. Sweet. They yeah, would be I... wiped out. They are. Oh, sorry. I may have misrepresented what I was saying. Mm. No one in an official capacity knows they are there. Yep. Yeah. I think yeah. if, if there was any, any chance that anybody knew about them, they would be gone. Ski. Oh, they're gone. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're killed. And it's not even a case down. of like, let's pull them in, let's you know, question, experiment, anything like that. It would just be pure extermination. Get in no. there, kill them all. It's yeah. it's just what what level are they on? Oh, three twenty two C. Yeah, cool. Um, just nuke that like that, and then like six levels up and down. Just do that. I don't care. <laughs> like why why are you asking me this like have you have you nuked them yet <laughs> oh you're still you're still here um you'll get you, nuked too you set that nuke off personally would you <laughs> like where's the boy with my tea like yeah, you yeah, would make no. a great part of the imperium i think with that attitude oh i would be so corrupt i <laughs> would be so corrupt just be like oh man you know what we should do what's that a whole bunch of ghast. What? <laughs> you go stand over there. Uh, you you would make a perfect dark angel because you'd be happily sitting on the fence, unable to decide where you want to go. And I would have sided with Horace. Hands down, I would have sided with Horace. What? Are yep. you insane? Nope. Nope. Siding with Horace. Why? Just, I, I, no, you know what? Official derail this one. You've got to tell me why in the Emperor's Great Earth, would you side with Horus? Because I like Erebus. Do you know what? i got to agree with you here. I don't mind Erebus. Erebus was just doing it his... Doing, just doing what he does. So my favourite Primarch is actually Lorgar. And it is Really? Lorgar. It is Lorgar. Because Lorgar just believed. That's all he wanted to do was believe... And he had that stripped from him, and obviously he it was it was in his nature, in who he was to believe, and they stripped that from him. They took it from him, and they crippled him. And what did he do? He still believed, but he was just guided down a different path. I mean, at the end of the day, Logar, Logar won the heresy because he kept saying, "Dad's a god," and then Dad was like, "No," and then yeah. King Blueberry made him. Took him to that planet, and then the emperor, sorry, Big E, made yeah. him kneel, and then King Blueberry destroyed his favorite city. Um, yeah. But now everyone thinks the emperor is a god, yeah. and Lorgas. I'm imagining just sitting there being like, "I told you guys, 
That, no, that's that's his yeah. new war cry for his army. Is we told I told you so. I told you so. <laughs> yeah, um, as they charge okay. into battle, I would not have picked you for a logger. I fan. love the word bearers. Um, the, the word bearers. Oh, the word bearers are insane. I love them. Um, oh, the, this nothing is, wrong. This, they did nothing. This wrong. is a beastman episode. Um, oh yes, yeah. If people they would, would they like would fight us, a lot. they would fight yeah, alongside. They the would fight alongside different. the word bearers. Uh, if people would like us to talk about Primarchs, tell us. We are happy to. Um, we'll talk about it on April 1st next year. 100%. April 1st next year, yeah. <laughs> um, we'll actually talk about it on our new podcast, The Primarchs. Why Perturabo is best and why no one actually likes Lehman Russ. Um, uh, okay, that's not the title because Perturabo no, is not best. Okay, firstly, okay, I'm re-railing this. Perturabo Re-rail. is best. He's not. Uh, he's the only one who did his job during the assault on Holy Terror. He... He was told break down the walls, and he did. Um, <laughs> We're not uh, started. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> um, let's talk about Beastmen in a capacity of chaos worship. Yeah, I mean the the modern iteration now, and I guess the the publicly acceptable version of the Beastmen is in some way a chaos worshiping format. You know. Um, and especially when you're talking about large numbers. So we sort of mentioned earlier about the variations that they, we get from different chaos gods. And so you have the Zangor, which is, you know, a little bit more of that weirder looking beastman, uh, that, that, that raptor-like beaks they have. They're, they're more almost bird-like. And this, is, this harps back to what I was saying earlier about beastmen being of different beasts. They don't have to be your goat-headed, your you know, your ram-headed, whatever the case might be. And the the I guess the, the Zangor shifts away a little bit from the traditional sense of the beastmen in that they are strong, they're very, you know, sort of warlike. The Zangor still is very warlike, but it doesn't rely on its strength and its and brutality to win its fight. It's got a little bit a little bit more cunning and obviously dabbles in the magic because the changer of ways is a coward. Yeah, well, they got the um, the basement shamans, and um, are they on the uh, are they the shamans? Yeah, basement shamans. They got they're flying yeah, around shaman. their little discs of uh, zinch and that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. But that, that's obviously the 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 top tier end of it. Even as a collective, they do exhibit some sort of, you know magical or warp-based energy. And it's again, it's not reflected necessarily in the game, like the the Zinchian demons are, but within the lore, most certainly they, they do show that they have an attunement to magic, yeah. which is cool. You can have that, but to me it steps away from what... The miniatures themselves, don't get me wrong, the miniatures themselves are friggin' awesome, but from a lore perspective, it steps away from what I believe... Uh, what a true beastman should be, which is just brutality, strength, and sort of this, you know, unthinking, remorseless enemy. Don't a lot of them live on the planet of sorceries, the new homeworld of the Thousand Suns? Do they really? I did not know that. Yeah. Um, okay. They're sort of seen as the like the native population. Um and obviously when the Thousand Suns go to war, they gather up these big herds of them who obviously want to serve the agents of their gods being the Thousand Suns. And yeah, they, they're they oh, classic beastmen. They're meat shields and mm. their shamans throw sort of like mega cantrips and spells in comparison to the Thousand Suns. But yeah, if for, for every bullet or grenade or blazooga round they take it's something that a, a thousand sun marine isn't taking once again yeah right. their life sucks uh but this is the sadness of them yeah the best thing about them in my opinion and you find this a lot of them without it being painted on the internet a lot of turquoise a lot of the greatest <laughs> color games workshop has ever produced hawk turquoise and frankly i'm a big fan I'm a big fan of the Hawk Turquoise. I'm a big fan of the Hawk Turquoise Beastman. Right. Also, uh, that, multiple arms. Like, just, they've all got, like, forearms and huge axes and knives and swords the, and stuff. It's, it's From awesome. an aesthetic point of view, yeah. I really like that with the, the multi-limbed and so forth. And this is, like, 
what we mentioned earlier about the Gene Steeler cult beatsman would be really cool as well. They would be absolutely bonkers, uh, special ridges on their heads and so forth. But yeah, from the aesthetic point of view, they, they are brilliant miniatures because they do break the aesthetic of what a beastman looks like. But I'm not even kidding. I have some right here. Oh, you do too. Yeah, right. Why do I have Zangors? Their shields uh, are rad. Because you're a hoarder of the oh, highest yeah. level. Yeah, I have no self-control and I purchase things constantly. Also, their legs look, they're a lot more avian yeah. in their, yeah. in their yeah. sort of uh, So they don't, A lot of them don't have the hooves either. They've got like like birdie feet. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. Like a little, little ibis feet, little bin chicken feet. Oh my god, gang idea. What, the bin chickens? Zangor bin chickens. <laughs> um, for any non-Australians who don't understand what a bin chicken is, uh, Google it. Uh, they're, you know, real poindexters will call them an ibis, but yeah. the official Australian designation is bin chicken. They're actually, uh, you may not know this, they're actually our native bird. Um, as in the, our chosen native bird as a country. Um, some people will say it's the emu or the cassowary, but no, it's the bin chicken. And Did you mean I'm, to say emu? No, it's emu. There's no Y. So how do you get the Y sound? So the By bin pronouncing chicken, it correctly, emu. No, it's, it's emu. Um, it's we're emu. not having this argument. We are it not having like this having argument. It sounds like you're having a problem. Delacroix. How the hell do you get that? It is Delac. You, sir, may not tell anyone how to pronounce anything. You're very, very angry about this. Oh, it is pronounced emu? It's emu. Not em- no, not emu. It's emu. <laughs> emu. I will be deleting all of your audio here, and it's just going to be... You're absolutely right, Nathan. It is emu. Thank you for acknowledging me as chieftain of uh, this podcast. And yes, I am very good looking. Thank you. Uh, back good to the Lord, industry yeah. of the episode. Um, oh, yeah, you're right. You are right. Industry, industry, industry. Enjoy your wild snake, buddy. Yeah. Trent, if you are listening to this still, we are sorry. We'd like to apologize to your family for causing this. <laughs> I'll come and see you in hospital, I promise. Ah, oh, are we busy? Oh, yeah, no, I'll be busy on that day that you say yeah. that you're in trouble. Yeah, yeah. sorry, mate. <laughs> um, yeah, I love the Zangors. I think they're rad. Um, and we have models for them, which is awesome. Um, yeah, I think the, modern, the kit, modern models yeah. of them. Um, and I can actually look at them right here. The kit does come with a, like a pistol and chain sword conversion kit here. Like, there's, they're actually cool little auto pistols. They're very... Um, ostentatious they're very zinchian yeah uh, yeah next up we are looking at blood gores or corn gores beastmen of corn um honestly there's not a lot to say here beyond their beastmen uh, they do mostly, yeah. what's written on the tin <laughs> they love a punch on yeah. they are all about it they're it typically says they have canine heads or faces and fierce snapping jaws and teeth which drip with rank saliva. Their skin or fur is usually red and their eyes are all white with red pupils. Yeah. That's See, cool. This is, yeah. this is just classic corn. But one thing I love about the description for the corn gores is... These foul creatures, enslaved to the worship of the blood god, populate many planets within the Eye of Terror. Dim-witted, cruel, unruly, and easily startled, they are always keen to kill for their masters, usually chaos space marines in service to the blood god, who are careless of their lives, sending pack masters to whip them toward the enemy guns. Remember all that stuff we've talked about? Yeah. How it's just like... Operation Gore Meat Shield. Yeah. Um, gang idea. No. Unit idea for a Chaos yeah. Space Marine or like World Eater Army. Do a unit of jackals, but instead of jackals, they're 
corn gores. Oh, yes. And their pack master is a jackal whipping them forward. Yes, I love that. Just and, like, has a, like, I don't know, a Chaos Space Marine shoulder pad or even a Chaos Space Marine backpack, right, just for the fuel source. Just and yeah. the, the whip is an electro whip that feeds off that fuel source. So oh. he's got he's got all the extra bits and bulbs to make him super special. So Perfect. he's like slamming that whip, ripping the, the ripping the flesh off him. Yeah, that's mad. Yep. Perfect. Yep. Yep. Love it. That is so cool. But they are they are the quintessential beastmen, you know, but just ramped up right to fifteen. You know what I mean? They're they're where the regular beastmen are like, oh yeah, we're a bit crazy. We're off chops. So we have a, you know, we go off and have a big weekend. But the blood gores, like they show them what a proper hard weekend is. Like yeah. they, they're just like, there's like what, what you think is destroying the enemy lines for us is maybe just the skirmish we get through and we're kicking the living daylights out of everything, even puppies. They're yeah. horrible. We- we talk about, we we killed the spare uniforms. Like we killed <laughs> everything. Yeah. Like old old bone chewer over there, he killed a table three times. It was the same table. Like yeah. Yeah. you you killed the people. Yeah, good one, buddy. Yeah, yeah. nice one, champ. Nice one. <laughs> we went after their booby traps. That's how hard we are. <laughs> yeah. Well, you wanted survivors? Yeah. No, no, nice one, champ. Nice. One. And then they would boo them, but being beastmen, it would come out like moo, moo, like a moo. That's the beastman boo, by the way. Obviously, officially, moo, sir, <laughs> moo. moo. <laughs> All right, I'll move on to our next ones. Actually, I, I was, you wanted me to talk about the pesticles, but I actually really love the slangors, and I say that because of the modern. Models that were modern iteration of them for Age of Sigma. I really wish you hadn't jumped ahead there. I really wanted to talk about Slangors. I ah, think they're so cool. Stole it. Okay, well, let's just quickly talk about Pestigors. Uh, no, stinky. you talk about you yeah. talk about the Slangors. I've actually got a couple of things I wouldn't mind saying about the Pestigors. Okay, right. Uh, so the Slangors, obviously, the Slanish worshipping beastmen, but and the, they draw their origins from. It's almost like they were the first beastmen sort of thing because if you think about the original uh, Greater Demon of Slanish, Keeper of Secrets, where this is like the the 90s miniature, it had the bull head. It almost seems fitting that there are beastmen that go along with with that aesthetic and that, that look. And they're, 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 they're used not only for combat, orientation but also for for rituals and for as as servants as well so they're they're where we have the the blood gores or the corn gores which are just thrown into battle battle that these these slang gores are actually used within the the pleasure palaces and used within all the ceremonies and for creating the the different sort of musks and so forth that the that Slanish have. I'm not going to dabble on that area too much because it starts to get a little bit, you know, how you going? But, how you going? <laughs> how you going? Yeah, not in a good way. But um, and the the cool thing about them is that they they're blessed with more sort of superhuman reflexes. They they, they embrace the the standard sort of Slanish of we're quicker, we're wittier, we're faster. We may not be as strong or as tough but we're going to zip around you about five times, which makes sense for them with their hooved, hooved feet, being able to bounce left, right and centre and so forth. But the modern iteration of their miniatures are absolutely stunning. They look so good. And they're the Slangor fiend bloods, Mate, yeah. these in any battlefield. Remember how I was talking about the, the Rogue Trader's bodyguard? Now these yes. as a bodyguard, yes, but not 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 for the road trader, but just for a, a slanish worshipping magos or something like that. Or I mean, you could even do them actually as the road trader's bodyguard because they would be doled up to the nines. They would have all this extra jewelry and all these extra ornaments and all this extra iconography that would just show that they come from a place of money. 
you know, that I think, oh, you just want to put a few more armor plates on them and so forth. And obviously the, the pincer hands is probably, you know, you might need to move them on a little bit because they are definitely not uh, Imperium approved. But my brother actually painted up some of the Slanesh Gores many, many years ago and he did the coolest paint scheme for them. They were white with uh, like a leopard print fur on them for their nice. for the fur hanging on. But it was a snow leopard fur. So it was like white with black dots. And then the white was all pink washed. So they had this like faint tone of pink to them. And they had purely blood red eyes. And this white and almost like, um, oh, what do they call them? People with... Who albinos. Albinos. They had this almost albino look to them. And so when the black popped on that, when the purple from, you know, a little bit of armor or, 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 a, or a claw or something popped on that miniature, the aesthetic of them made them look really otherworldly and very over-the-top slanishy. They were they were so cool. He had them in a Mordheim board game or band. And they just, yeah, they looked really cool. But I love them because... They are exactly what Slanish would have. Yep. Weird, weird things that getting up to weird things, and we'll leave it there because we're G-rated. Mm. But also, <laughs> you're absolutely right in regards to the the miniatures. There, they are everything about them is sleek. It's powerful. It's you know, they emulate the the their patron god so well to the point of i don't necessarily think they would be as unintelligent as regular beastmen i see them oh, right. as yeah. i actually see them as somewhat more oh, sophisticated is the wrong word but able to acclimatize to sort of like cohabitation with humans with their cults, like, don't get me wrong, you're going to have dummy, dumb, dumb slime gores. Mm. Absolutely. But once they gain, once they gain knowledge, slime gores, slime gores, I think would have the ability to be calculating, to be cunning, to, to learn. be, yeah, right. uh, yeah. to be maybe not the leader of a war band, but your magister, for example, is going to have oh. one of these at his right hand because, you know, they don't have armor, but yeah. they don't need armor because you're not going to hit them. My champion, yeah, right. my champion is this enormous, and the, um, the, the slime gore champion only has one of those clawed hands. It has that big, beautiful axe in the other hand. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, I think, I think that is, that is a a closer iteration of humanity when it comes to their intellectual capacity. I, I'm yeah. When you say it like that, they are closer to the human variation of the, yeah. the, the beastman rather than the beast variation or the beast side of it. It makes sense. And I could see them, you know, having a majesty about them, not just a, yes. not just his brutality about them. But more reflecting, like you, you could almost see a slangor with a long sort of robe, and you know, it, it doesn't rely on violence. It relies no. on its capacity to to be alluring, you know. Yeah. Like do you know, and it's, it, this is going to sound weird, so we might have to edit it out. But you know, you see a, a beautiful horse, right? Like a a, a steed, a stallion. Right. Just bear with me here. You can appreciate that it's a beautiful horse. Delete you know. button on standby. Yeah, <laughs> you can see that it's a beautiful horse. It's, it's got a shiny, it's like I don't know what do you call it the the mane the mane and and it's just it like especially around races here in Melbourne. There's so many of these beautiful animals. There's something that captivates people towards them. That's the way I would see a slangle, this captivating creature. There's, you're almost distracted by the slang or you're looking at it, you're just going, what is that? And so yeah. violence leaves your mind yeah. just for that second. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the magister is right up against you and is going, you don't want to fight us. Yeah. You, you're intrigued by us, you know. Mm. 
We can bring you power. We can bring you fame, fortune, mm. women, men. We can bring you... Basement. Basement. Mm. We can bring you beast ladies. <laughs> um, we heard there's a particular gang of muscle mummies in your dome that, <laughs> you know, you, you wouldn't mind a couple of those phone numbers. Uh, yeah. And it's that, it's that attraction of Slanesh. And no, I agree with you. I think the Slangors are quite possibly... Basically, the entire Slanesh range from mm. Age of Sigma is so awesome. Um, oh, it is. And the, the Slangors exemplify that for me. Yeah, no, it is a stunning range that it, it needs to be... The entirety of it needs to be a Lost and Damned army in 40k or just make slanishy themed gangs out the wazoo with these miniatures. They are just ridiculous. But anyway, onto something just as aesthetically pleasing. The Pestigors, where instead of silks, perfumes and jewellery, these uh, friendly individuals are covered in pus and poop and vomit and uh, sores and all sorts of horrible disease. Um, that being said, as devotees of Nurgle, they're all actually pretty happy about it. So the Pestigors, the beastmen of Nurgle, um, retain a morbid vigor that characterizes their master. So their afflictions in no way mar their battle worthiness. And thanks to their loyalty to Grandfather Nurgle, they often also carry Nurgle's rot. And the mark of Nurgle is carved into their armour, daubed upon their clothes, and sometimes etched into their skin by the path of disfiguring disease. These are basically like chemical warfare, but without <laughs> the uh, over sim- like the over abundance of complication, where they just walk into a settlement and just pop themselves like an enormous blister with legs and hair. And it's actually all of a sudden, vile. Yeah, yeah we go everyone is all of a sudden dead. Um, <laughs> honestly, not a blind date you want to go on. Uh, I love Pestigors because uh, I'm a huge fan of the older Black Library uh, Warhammer fantasy novels. And there's a couple of Pestigors in the Brunner, the Bounty Hunter book. Um, and he's to, this, this Pestigore is described kind of like a real cool, calm and calculating, but pretty happy fella. Like yeah. he's, he's, he has this weird lisp, um, because and all, there's always flies around him and that, but he's just like, man, people just have to accept Nurgle. Like he takes away your pain. Yeah. I know my muscles and my body is rotting and I'm full of pus and vomit and there's a random Nurglings that pop out of my neck, but I'm happy. I'm basically <laughs> indestructible. Like, yeah, just go with it, my dude. Um, I would love to see 40k Pestigors. I think the fact they didn't come out with the Death Guard range was uh, was a real shame. I would have loved to have seen the four sort of uh, major god-aligned factions to have had Ish, their own yeah. Beastman ranges. Like, that would have been cool. Now, do you know what I always thought it was going to come to? Because the Zarngors were released oh, quite a while ago now. Oh, years ago now. Years ago. So when... I, I'm almost certain... Yeah, I'm almost certain they came out before... Before the Death Guard. I'm certain. Actually, no, I'm certain. Not that I'm certain. I know no, 100%. Death, Death Guard came out first, didn't they? No, I reckon... Because the 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 Thousand Suns got their book, and then the Death Guard got their book, and I'm pretty sure the Zangor were in that book. I, I I'm happy to be corrected on this one, folks. But uh, yeah, I think it would have been brilliant to have all four God aligned uh, legions have a um, a basement variation from, them. and and the 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 Corn Gores or Blood Gores would have looked brilliant. But getting back to the the Pestigors. The, the Pestigors sort of strike me more as lone figures, you know. There's not necessarily these these fighting war bands, but these these journeymen of Nurgle who uh, yeah. are just sort of accepted in the sense that, oh, it's just a, you know, it's just a diseased follower. 
but they just simply plot along. I can almost see them riding a horse as well, which is a little bit, you know, oh. a little bit of sort of Planet of the Apes style, like where you've got an ape riding a horse. This is a, this is a, uh, a beastman Planet riding of the Pestigals, yeah. Planet of the Pestigals riding into town and, and a classic um, Nurgle miniature where it basically looks like death riding in on the, the corrupted oh, steed and so stop forth. it. But you have this Pestigal with just f- like heavy robes, not flowing, just dragging off him and like heavy leathers and so forth, just coming into a settlement and just having a bit of a whisper and just looking at their water supply and, you know... Just throwing a handful of something in there and just reaching into bottom. his gut, pulling out some slime and throwing yeah. it into a yeah. into a uh, aqueduct and just being yeah. like, yeah. nice. But there's 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 this simplicity to that pesticore as well because they they wouldn't have that almost playful cunning of a human member of Nurgle. They would they would have this simplicity of just. You know, there's there's a calling to just infect, and they go around and they infect, and they have this they have this untapped brutality that they can draw on when needed, but the majority of the time it's just this almost mournful. Oh, do you know what? For me, I just thought of it then. I was just saying it. This mournful, sad character that exemplify the like the nature of where the beastman sits within the forty first millennium, and Nurgle would be the only one who would truly give them a place, you know, because Nurgle accepts all, yeah. So Nurgle just goes, come on, just, you know, just kiss the toad. That's what we are. Nur- Nurgle is the good guy of the Chaos Gods. They, absolutely, but Nurgle would just accept the beastmen and say, you don't have to go off and fight for me. You don't have to destroy the Imperium. You can, We can have the Imperium, but the Imperium just needs to know how to bloom. So go forth and allow it to bloom. You know, and so the, these sad characters that would just be drawn into willowing away in their sadness about how they're not loved by any part of the galaxy get to be embraced by Nurgle, get to be, you know, carried into the galaxy upon this wave of petulance and, uh, not petulance, um, pestilence, a wave of pestilence and taken off and there's a comforting, they finally have their home. Yeah. Oh, good on your grandfather, Nurgle. Yeah. Maybe Once feel again, good about I, I the feel, I feel kind of bad for uh, the basement. You should. They have yeah. no place unless they're with Nurgle. Yeah. Well, I've, so of the four we've mentioned so far, only the Zarngors and Slangors have uh, existing miniatures. Uh, but there are some generic basement miniatures out there. Uh, the obvious ones sort of for generic basemen being either the uh, Chaos Basemen from Blackstone Fortress. Remember those? Yep. They were awesome. Yep. Uh, Excellent miniatures. Have, Looking at yeah, them right now, actually. Yep. You have the absolutely awesome Felgor Ravages from yeah. Kill Team. Oh, in fact, I've got one of those here. That was the mini of the month oh, a few months ago. Oh, you did too, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. He's joining my, uh, my Chaos Militia because, unfortunately... He's been bullied, much like we were bullied into doing this episode, and he's been bullied into joining up with Renegade Chaos Militia. And then <laughs> well, it because... sounds like he had his arm twisted. Yeah. He really did. Uh, he, <laughs> he wasn't down for it at all. And because I occasionally remember this is a Necromunda podcast, we have Gore Halfhorn, the Beastman Bounty Hunter. Uh, That's right, yes. Yeah. Um, Another absolutely sick miniature, really throwing into that sort of old school. Do you remember the, uh, there was a Imperial Army beast mini had the chainsword and the plasma pistol. Imperial? The metal miniature from years oh, and years Oh, yeah, and yeah, years yes, ago. yes, 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 I've, I do. I don't remember if it's actually been confirmed, but I've always believed that Gore Harfhorn was based on that miniature there because okay. yeah. there were always just so many characteristics that I found similar, um, primarily being the armament, the chainsword and plasma pistol. Um, yeah. But that's, yeah, that, uh, that's... Is that, is that actually a plasma pistol that he's equipped with? Yeah, man. 
That's a funky looking plasma pistol. Yeah, it's it looks very like Great Crusade era. It looks mm. it mm. looks almost like um it's it's not a common mark pistol. Like, it's not common. It looks like a one off. Yeah, I really like it. I mean obviously his armor has been sort of hammered into place from, you know, maybe some Goliath have made it for him. Maybe he's picked it up somewhere. Maybe he's made it himself. Yeah, but right. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it's very, very cool. Then you obviously have a lot of the older sort of Rogue Trader era Beastman miniatures. I think there were definitely a couple of them. Uh, I think there was one with an auto gun. There was one with, what's uh, the word I'm looking for, like close combat weapons, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, right. So yeah. There, there, there always have been miniatures of them. Yeah, and like even even in epic scale, there was yeah there were yeah. there you had units of minotaurs, you had units of basemen, so there there was always a presence there, but um, yeah, I guess harping back to Necromunda, I guess the only thing we really have is Gore half horn, but we still have the capacity to involve them, as you say, by creating gangs and and filtering them into your game systems like that, or even. You know, I, I just think I always I'm sort of getting on the idea of how to incorporate stuff into campaigns, I think is is a great way to add so much depth and story. So you could have a raid on a now known beastman compound. You know what I mean? So Yeah. It's yeah. Im- imperial sanction given. There's your edict, go get them. When it was at uh I think it was in a ten thousand year history where we talked about how the Inquisitions which Inquisition was just handing out uh, <laughs> tickets like uh, you're going a deputy, psycho you're hunting. A deputy. Going, yeah, they're going That's psycho it. hunting, remember? That's it, yes. So they're just handing out the tickets to say, you're all deputies now. And that's what I can imagine you could do for a scenario for hunting down yeah. basement. Was the Escher just collecting all the um, special ammunition and just being like, this is the... But I have a crossbow on a bolt gun. <laughs> oh, buddy. Yeah. But that's, there you go. Like, there's a great example. You go like a radical uh, Ordos Hereticus Inquisitor who's got this abhuman warband behind him because he's like, they are only loyal to me. Yeah. Like, and yeah. I'm loyal to the Emperor. You know? Yeah. And yeah. You know, regular Inquisitors looking at this guy being like, um,. <laughs> your your beastman is eating that man's face. He's like, he's probably a heretic. Yeah, yeah we should shoot the beastman. He's like, I'm talking about the faceless guy. What are you talking about? <laughs> exactly. Um, it's it's but yeah, turning around and saying, no, the beastman's loyal because they're loyal to me, and that's yeah, all that the, matters. But the anyway, beastman's yeah. eating in that guy's face because that guy's a heretic. How is this math not mathing for you? Are you a heretic as well? Um, Go get his no face, inqui- Gore. Yeah, yeah. No inquisitor. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm whatever you want me to be. It's exactly Excellent choice. Be. Excellent choice. And you three, what are you doing? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Yep, yep. Do you know where we are? Can you take us home? Do you want to go purging? Yes. Yes, yeah. we do. Um, so... Speaking of bringing Beastmen into your gangs and campaigns, we're wrapping this bad boy up and we cannot do this without gang ideas. So I've given a couple. Do you? Right. I've given a couple, but I have another one. But I want to hear oh, one I thought you said you've you. got a couple. You've, you've I've, given I've, a couple. Still, I've still got one left. Oh, uh, okay. I, I've got one that's been brewing in my head and I sort of half mentioned it earlier. But um, it's actually the concept of, like, elite shock troop beastmen. So very much like, what is it, the data slug that they would pump into the Goliath. They would do that with this beastman as well. So beastmen, sorry. They would put a data slug in there and they become, like, almost like a special forces team. So... It's not just about the close combat. Like, there, you do not mess with them in close combat. They will take you down. But they, you would change the aesthetics of how they would look. So they would have, like, plate armour. Uh, they would be mainly covered up with armour, gauntlets and so forth. They would have little data readouts on their arms. 
but for me, it's the face of what I see. So the, the horns themselves would actually have armor plating on them. The face would have, do you know the, the oh, it's, it's, on, it's on the best of all models from the Warhammer range where it's got these eye covers that have just got all these tiny yeah, little holes on. Yeah, 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 yeah. So a fully black mask with tiny little red dots painted into all those dots to represent sort of like the glowing sort of vast amount of information being passed into this beastman. And they would be used as like shock and awe terror troops, but in a special forces manner. So they would be sent in and there's no whole bar, like you, you go get them, you know what I mean? But they would look, and so you'd have carapace armor across the whole lot of them. They would have bolt guns where applicable or auto guns. They would have chain swords, and they would have other, like even servo skulls, stuff that you would never associate with them. But they're all being funded by one of the noble houses, so they use these when they want to send a message. Very much like leaving a horse's head in someone's oh. bed, you send in the beastman, and they just brutalize an area. And one of the reasons I, th I thought about it is the idea that the stories that come out of that, it's like, no, we got, we got attacked by beastmen. And they're like, yeah, but look at these, look at the, the, the grouping patterns on the shooting. The beastmen don't fight like this. You know, there, there was These so, ones did. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's like, it's almost like a make-believe story. So the, the survivors would just be, they'd be shunned. They'd be like, no, you guys, you're not telling the truth. You're just creating some sort of fancy tale to say you got rock and rolled by a Vansar gang, but you don't want to admit it. You're like, no, no, no. We got we got stomped out by beastmen and they were elite level. Like they came in almost silent like. I reckon that would be absolutely brilliant. That's and you could see them sick. sneaking through tunnels. So a lot of their the aesthetic that we normally see of the beastmen of the bared chest and the fur and all that a lot of that would be covered up with armor plates. Oh, how would you run them? What would you run them as? I was thinking just mainly because off the back of the Goliath episode, but also because you get to mess around with how they're, they're Gene different Smith stuff. Thing. Gene Smithing, yeah. Um, I would run them as that. Do you know what I mean? And then the weaponry that you have available to you would also suit them very, very well. So... The Goliath for me, after having done that episode, by the way, uh, really scream as your your base level of where you can create some absolute nonsense gangs and just crowbar them into the Goliath framework. But yeah, yeah. that's that's my. I had this visual in my head of these like just almost completely painted in black, like almost a glossy type armor, very minimal unit identification markings on them, glowing red eyes, but in just a small amount, little like shoulder mounted lamps and laser finders and so forth very high tech looking basement so going against the normal aesthetic of what they look like but the idea is that they do have a data slug imp implanted in their head where they become even more sentient even 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 more capable of more advanced tasks but yeah Damn. that's my gang idea what is your oh, i really like that yeah, and the, the fact you're doing them, them as Goliaths where you can really screw around with the genetics and um, I, see, this goes back to our idea of their origins of what are they, a science experiment, chaos god, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You've turned around and you've given an origin for them. This noble house breeds them as elite shock and punishment troops. Yeah, like. Yeah. They're not going to have an army of them. They can't get no, away with that. No, no, no. But they, they might have like 50, 30 60 or 40 of them. or 50. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they're broken up into all individual squads. So they have their own little herd of five or six. Oh. We are our own herd and we're this elite group. And they, they understand that, you know, if they're whittled down to one member remaining, they don't get replacements. You just continue being functional until you're gone. Yeah, man, these are... These these raider herds, these like these punishment herds. Yeah. Oh, that is sick. But they they don't just go off and raid. They have missions. You know. Yeah, I mean? they they are directed. Yeah, yeah. So you would have their packmaster would be a member of the noble house, 
who would be like an honorary baseman in their eyes. Huh. Oh, so your your uh, your tyrant is actually a human. Yes, yeah, a hundred percent. A Tala Noble House would control them. They wouldn't have a pack master who's one of them. Their squads, like their their little small herd of four or anywhere between four to six members, would they would be a leader within that. But that's as high as their hierarchy goes. Being able to control four to five members, that's it. Yeah, that's sick. I love that. Yeah. That's that's the idea that's been ruminating in my head. And uh, it's crazy, but I almost see them like done up like those death troopers from Star Wars, like yeah. full black glossy armour, like very minimal signatures and glows coming off them, but enough to make them look truly intimidating. The armoured hooved feet. Oh, sick idea. Oh, and you could use the uh, the Tau stealth suits. There you go. Uh, yes. They've got that, 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 uh, that circular armour, but they've got hooves because yes. obviously the Tau. Yeah. Um, oh. Damn. Damn, do Ungors as Pathfinders using the Pathfinder kit because oh, you could yeah. necromunder up the armour, but the Pathfinder legs, they're hooved. Yes, absolutely. Oh, Damn. Sorry. Add that to the... I'm just going to quickly add that to my list. Um, funnily enough, I was looking at this list the other day and I'm like, I have no idea what some of these references are. And then I laughed because I was, uh, I said, looked at Kingdom of Heaven Goliath. And I'm like, i got to watch Kingdom of Heaven. So I watched Kingdom of Heaven. Um, but yeah, I'm adding here, Pathfinder Gores. That's... Kingdom of Heaven Goliath. Remember you were talking about the Goliath in our Goliath episode? You're like, what if they were like knights? And I'm oh, like, I'm going to add this to my list. I'm going to have no idea what I'm talking about. Right, but I mate. immediately, I knew what I was talking about. But then I was like, I'm going to watch Kingdom of Heaven. So I, I still, I still abide by that I see them as a group of knights as with, we, uh, had, we had several comments of people being like I really like his knight idea and I'm like no watch <laughs> Kingdom of Heaven um, <laughs> also yeah, one other I thing with my sick. gang one other thing with my gang is obviously the noble representative the, the, the one who's like the um, you know the pseudo beastman he would be called Billy Billy Beastman Pardon? Billy Beastman? No, Billy Goat. <laughs> and that was our latest episode of... <laughs> Gee, like... That was hilarious, but I'm not laughing. Um, <laughs> I might have done all of that just to get in the reference Billy Goat, but I don't know. Fair. You'll that's never fair. know. Anyway, um, what's your gang idea, sir? Please tell me. Um, I want to be impressed. I now really just want to talk about my Korgors. Um, no, I am thinking uh, about Ash Waste Nomads, um, where a pack of beastmen who were, you know, who are descended from the original sort of, you know, prisoner with job crew of beastmen that were delivered to Necromunda, who have been out in the wastes and have been cultivating and breeding species of sort of like worker beast. So very similar to they'd go out and they'd be hunting, maybe not the Helamites, but they'd be hunting um, Saurians from, you know, this this section of the wastes where there were these huge lizards, basically like giant frilled neck lizards, and they'd ride them instead. Um, basically give me an excuse to kit bash Beastmen and all of the cool new monsters from the Lizardman range. Yeah, yeah, righto. <laughs> so, which are an amazing range, by the way. Oh, oh, that, I found a is it a Stegodon uh, from years and years ago in my horde the other day, and I'm just staring at it like I can turn this into Necromunda, and I've just given myself an idea. Hot damn! Okay, so I would do this Beastman as basically nomads. And they would have been sort of trading with some of these outland settlements. You know, people see them. They don't cause any problems, whatever. But then during the Arantian succession, when the Crusades were occurring, these small encampments of these sort of... This loose coalition of tribes of beastmen have been attacked by these 
religious fanatics. And it's then caused them to sort of pull together under the strongest war leaders and go, enough's enough. We're going to find ourselves a place we can go to, colonize and fortify. So they've gone to the nearest settlement that had walls, basically just kicked seven shades out of everyone (laughs) and have put the call out as this is a safe harbour for non-humans. So it's an abhuman alliance they're calling out to ogrins, ratlings, anyone who doesn't fit within that cookie-cutter, human-shaped like classification, come to us. So your ogren will be these, like, you know, they'll have the, um, the head coverings and they'll have... Uh, like makeshift nomad backpacks and these huge heavy bore like dust proof rifles yeah, your rattlings okay. you know, every, it's, everyone's going to be very basic technologically but it's going to be a collection of ab humans who have come together under the leadership of this this uh, this gore war leader who's basically saying the humans don't care for us only we care for us. And if you are kicked down by humanity, you can join us. You might have a squat here and there. Uh, you might have your own human who's in the settlement, but they are very much so a second-class citizen underneath this uh, this gore who's gone from, you know, uh, sort of second string to I'm a tyrant now. I'm going to be the worst parts of it. And they're attacking Goliath colonies. They're attacking Cordor, you know, uh, these Crusaders. They're attacking Orlock road trains and they're bringing it all back. So you'd have these huge muscle bound gores in Goliath armor with like the metal mohawks that they've fashioned for themselves. And then you'd have some in like the denim vests of the. Um, the Orlocks, where they're basically, yeah. this is who I've killed. And the oh. tribe would be recognising each other by that. You know, That's almost cool. like we're, we're be- taking the personas of those we've defeated. Um, but yeah, it basically just gives me an excuse to buy a bunch of uh, lizardmen beasts and be <laughs> like, ooh, I'm going to strap some guns to a lizard. <laughs> Do you know, it, it, I love this idea where they're taking on the persona of the how, the clans as well. So it's like, we, we're the specialist Orlock killers. Oh, no, no, no. We're the specialist Escher killers. And so they adorn themselves with trophies of that gang, but they also begin to utilise their weapons because those weapons become more readily available to them as well. Yeah. If so I'm only have, killing Goliath, I want uh, Goliath equipment because I'm going to yeah. get Goliath ammo. Yeah, exactly. So I'm straight away thinking of Escher specialists specialist specialist killers so who i've got like you know rebreathers on holding a massive chem cannon uh you know how mad would that look well, on the basement head isn't there a Philgore ravager he's got the big gas he does he's yeah throwing the he's canisters. Throwing... yeah he does yeah that would look so mad and then my death mooden <laughs> yes yes Damn that it. Is, I think that it is just it. became an Escher gang. That is the best one you've ever done. A death mood. And... <laughs> also, yeah, I mainly say this because I'm just like, I want to take one of those Goliath Maulers, change it to a Beastman on there because that would just look so Oh, rad. my God. How amazing would that look? I'd love the idea of a Beastman on a cutter as well, just holding on for dear life. Yeah. Just... <laughs> just uh... <laughs> Instead of zoom, 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 it'd be moom, moom, moom. Moom, uh, moom. Samuel, stop. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's my idea, this this I, I alliance. Love, I love it, the whole idea, because what I was talking about before, about the campaign and so forth. So you have this, this settlement made up of all these different factions that are all part of the same, you know, all under the same umbrella, but... Delacroix Beastman. Oh, uh, that would look so cool. Remove its horns. Remove its horns. You'd still put it in the in the um, Delac body. Yeah. And, oh, okay. I'm going to make that model tomorrow. 
That would look so cool. You yeah. almost want to go use an ungor head for it. You know, no, you'd, you'd use an ungor yeah. head. He'd yeah. still have the goatee, but you just take the horns down, or you'd obviously cut the tips of them off, almost like yeah. he files them. Yes, and then, yeah, and give him the big, uh, the big eye lenses and that sort of thing. Yep, yep, um, has to have it. And oh, then this God secreted damn. away sort of like, you know, auto pistol, repeater pistol, whatever you want to call it, that tucked away into the body, but the very tight fitting, long leather coat. That's sick. I I love this gang idea. Yeah, because it's more than a gang idea. It's like a whole. Um, it's just. It's a whole civilization. Model basement, the... however you want. Yeah. Yeah. Model ab humans, however you want. And just be like, oh, yeah, that one's dressed like a Goliath, and that's a Delark, and that's an Escher, and that's a Vansar. Mm. And a, yeah. But they're Vansar for this game. Like, mm. and you it, you allow yourself to play so many different ways. God. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. That's my gang. Uh, I liked my Korgors. But I like this abhuman alliance because it also basically gives me the excuse to make more abhumans. <laughs> and I have a Blood Bowl Ogren here somewhere. Sorry, Ogre. He's not an yeah. Ogren. Yeah, it's yeah. a Blood Bowl Ogre here somewhere. Is that the one with the horned helmet? There is one with the horned helmet, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure it comes out of the Norse. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the uh, one with the... Is it the human tea? Yeah. Yeah, I've got him. Oh, uh, right. I know, I know which one you're talking about. Yeah. 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 Uh, I don't know. Ogre. 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 Can't keep making that same mistake, Samuel. Yeah. Oh, I will. I will. <laughs> uh, his, yeah, it's just Blood Bowl Ogre. Yeah, that's all his name is. Uh, he's going for the big punch. But then you've got like the, the actual Ogre Blood Bowl team. Oh, man, they would make some great beastman ogre um ogre. so <laughs> that is my gang idea i love now, it it's uh, i normally don't love your stuff so that's really good oh thanks bud <laughs> <laughs> no i i genuinely love it because you could just play around so much but as i said it creates a whole encampment a whole base that you get to work with rather than just one gang yeah yeah and you can you can literally build you could build a you know free ogren gang you could build a gang of mm. venators and you can just keep building from that point and you could use the same hangers on and all that sort of stuff because they would all just be the guys and gals that would be hired out from this one particular settlement which I'm calling yeah. freehold um, freehold yes yeah. Freehold, freehold. I'm trying to think of something funny. No, I have nothing. Yeah. Which is pretty rare. Pretty It, it rare. is pretty rare. So, we've been talking for quite a while about Beastmen. Now, uh, to all of our bullies out there, um, there you go. There's an episode on abhumans. Uh, we will not be talking about any abhumans ever again. Uh, because... I can't even think of a joke. We will obviously be talking about abhumans again. Yes. Um, yeah. Because this is now just being like, oh man, do you want to have like a three hour conversation about rattlings? Uh, <laughs> and then we've obviously got like just a general overview navigators who I'd love to talk about. Uh, we've obviously got the Ogrens and the Squats or Leagues of Votan, uh, both of whom would have their own episodes anyway. Yeah. Um, then I have made several disturbing promises to several of our listeners, uh, that I will talk about cat people as well. Yeah. Um, I was going to You don't have this. to be here for that part. I don't think I will be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, my voice is, in case people can't know, I've started getting sick, uh, this week and my voice has been steadily going throughout the episode so uh the weekend's coming up and i am looking forward to a couple of days of not talking so nath before my voice goes completely any closing thoughts on beastman episode one of our ab human series 
Oh, look, I, I just re reiterate what I was mentioning there. I think if you need to look at the, the basement as this rather melancholic type of uh, creature within the, the 40k universe and also within the, the Necromunda universe, I think if you build from that, you can make some really awesome miniatures and some awesome themes and lore behind them. And uh, yeah, I, I think you have the potential here to to make some really crazy, awesome conversions with them because because they don't fit in any world completely, they have this freedom that allows them to be taken to any any area of Warhammer 40,000 or Necromunda and allow you to play with that, the concepts and the ideas with them heaps. But yeah, no, I, I'm, I, I very much think I'll be making my fully armoured Beastman gang at some stage in my life. I don't know if it's going to be sooner, but it's probably I have later. some enforcers sitting here doing absolutely nothing if you would like some uh, uh, enforcer armor. Enforcer armor would work, I think. I think so. Yeah, it just needs to, it needs to look bulky enough. Yeah, uh, this, I've got some subjugators. Those oh, things perfect. are bulky. Yeah, that would be perfect for them. Yeah, I'll take you up on that. Thanks, mate. Oh, good, buddy. Now... I agree wholeheartedly. I love Beastman. Uh, my my independent state of freehold, much like a uh, quick shout out to our boy Balthazar, sorry, Narco Lord Balthazar Van Zep. Thank you. Uh, yep. First patriarch of the free state of Zep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we love you, sir. Uh, <laughs> much like uh, the free state of Zep, the free state of freehold uh, will rise and live for a thousand years of freedom. Uh, right, okay. Yep. We are going to close this episode off with a quote, and I actually have a Beastman quote. Beastman bad. Bad Beastman. Dirty. Emperor no like. Beastman love Emperor. Give blood to Emperor. Give heads to Emperor. Say sorry. And that was Packmaster Grasht, attached to the 7th Company of the 14th Gratinor Regiment, Imperialis Auxilia, during the Great Crusade. And that was our latest episode of the Underhive Lore Keepers podcast. I am Spamiel, and on behalf of the Lawkeeper team, thank you for listening. Please follow us on our social media pages available in the show notes, and don't forget to follow and review us on your preferred podcast platform. As always, if you have questions, complaints, corrections, or if you too must bleed the enemies of the Emperor to earn your salvation, please reach out to us at underhivelawkeepers at gmail.com. Thanks.